we maybe not the exact 100% implementation of how we are bringing it, but let's look at what we can do to um, possibly take the, the meat of what we're asking for and implement it. Um, <clears throat> because if you, re if you also recall, um, I argued to expand the utilities and couldn't do it, but ultimately utilities did end up getting expanded. So hopefully we could work a little bit more towards trying to make the things happen that the CRAs are wanting instead of it being um, frowned upon. The, cities, the city ideas and plans for the CRAs are typically celebrated and, and brought to us with glee. But when it comes from the CRA to the city, it's typically frowned upon. And so I'd like to see if we can fix that relationship so that we can do a lot more in a, in a lot faster time frame and, and affect a lot more people within our footprint. And I believe that's the purpose and the idea behind how the CRAs are supposed to work in the first place. So I would like to see a little bit more with that. But um, that's my update. Um, I'm open to any questions um, regarding any of the programs that we've done or we're looking to do or um, any updates or suggestions regarding um, trying to move a little bit faster with implementation. Thank you, Ms. Gilly, for your report. Any board members have any questions for Mrs. Gilly? Then, then Tyler had a question, unless somebody else did first. Mr. Mr. Uh, Dinkfeld, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Ms. Goodley, <clears throat> for all your hard work. Um, I think uh, some council members probably feel your pain. Uh, maybe you're in training to be a council member uh, and be, be ignored and told we couldn't do things. Um, but we just, I do feel your pain. Um, <clears throat> On a serious note, um, I did have a question, a follow-up question in regard to uh, to the East Tampa uh, youth program, and I think it's it's been a great program over the over the years that I can see. Um, I was wondering <clears throat> if staff um, or the CAC ever does any sort of long-term follow-up. In other words, it looks like we've We've been involved with this program for 14 years and and uh, helped a lot of young young people. I just wonder if we know what happened to those young people, and you know maybe they've gone on to college and maybe they have good things to say about the program and and uh, and that sort of thing, uh, or maybe they have you know suggestions on how we can improve the program now that they're young adults. Um, so that was question number one, and then question number two was probably more to Michelle, um, which is, I think that youth program is so good. I wonder if we shouldn't think about expanding it if we haven't already to uh, West Tampa and maybe Ybor City, um, if, if there are youth within living within Ybor City. We know there's plenty of them in West Tampa. So anyway, um, Ms. Goodley, uh, to you or Ed Johnson, uh, that's the first question related to follow up, and then this this Van Loan to you on the uh, expansion of that program. I'll I'll mute myself now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Interesting, Ms. Gilly or Ms. Van Loan. I I personally have not um, talked to any of the youth that have completed the summer youth program. Maybe you know five ten years ago. I would definitely be interested to see what they are doing and if they're interested in um, possibly doing a where are they now. I wrote that down in my notes to reach out. I think that's an excellent idea because everyone that I've talked to has completed the program probably three years ago or less, and all of them are just ecstatic about being in the program. I would have never thought it would have made that much of an impact on um on these kids but it it has so i'm definitely interested to do a where are they now with some of the older ones 
Uh, good morning, uh, CRA board members, Michelle Van Loan, Community Redevelopment Department. Uh, that's also the concept of where are they now. Most of our contact with the youth are anecdotal or where they come back to us. We have had instances after the eight weeks that they work with us in the summer whereby uh, some of our youth have gone on to work full time with the city either with our neighborhood enhancement team or parks and recs and other department. Uh, we do have a young lady who was with us in 2010 as part of the youth program and she is still with us today with the neighborhood enrichment and enhancement team. And uh, we're very proud of her work with us and that she started through the youth program. And uh, she originally used to give us testimonials and wanted to be the poster child for the success of our program. And would talk about how prior to our summer youth program, she was not exactly hanging out with some of the best kids. Uh, and uh, the youth program helped her see that there were alternatives to lifestyle and to uh, understand the value and appreciate uh, earning her own money and uh, being able to make her way in the world. And then she really loved working with the city so much that like I said, she's now one of our full-time employees. But we can certainly work with HR for that contact information to look at, again, as uh, uh, Councilman Dean Felter and Natasha, uh, Natasha suggested, uh, sort of where are they now? We could even turn it into a newsletter and uh, start tracking some of the emails and reaching out. So we will certainly look at that as regards to expanding the program, um, we can certainly bring that up to the CACs and talk with Morris um, about doing that under current legislation and our current community redevelopment plans and so forth. So we'll certainly bring that up and have them review that option. Thank, thank you to both of you um, for your response. The, um, in regard to expansion, I would think that uh, West, especially West Tampa, would be really primed for this, and and I think we have had good success over the years uh, with the East Tampa program, and I, I would think that uh, West Tampa could model that. So I would hope that the West Tampa CAC, uh, at a minimum, would embrace it, and and maybe even Ebor City. You know, I I don't know how much residential, um, you know, lower income residential Ebor embraces anymore, but perhaps there's a smattering. So anyway, that's that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. King. Any other you know, questions on the board members? Uh, Carl, this is Carlson. You recognize, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goodley, um, you may have heard in, in one or more of the previous meetings, I had the same concerns you did about uh, the definition of what we can do with um, the, the CRA money. And, um, uh, you know, I had asked like a year ago, maybe I got the idea from you originally, I don't remember, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I had asked if it was possible to use it for helping small businesses and um, helping with capacity building and, and other kinds of things. And the, and the answer was no. And then the, the legal definition we got um, for the one Tampa was very narrow and um, singular in its, um, in its use. I think it, you bring up a good point by bringing this up again, and maybe um, maybe what we should do is um, is try to plan for the future in anticipation of some other event like this. I mean, the the staff at the city, I think, did a great job. We, looking backwards, we can always critique what they did, but um, they assembled quickly. They put together the best plan they could. They acted quickly. Um, uh, and but now that we have the benefit of hindsight, maybe we can look and see, you know, what is the unique role of the CRA? And since we're custodians of this money that's supposed to be used a particular way, maybe we can go ahead and preset um, some programming that we could put in place as CRAs um, when an event like that hits. So anyway, thank you for bringing that up. And um, if you uh, have any specific recommendations, I would be glad to support them. Thank you. Any other board members? Any other Mr. Board Chairman. Members? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, one, other, one other follow on idea, my wife, I'm going to give you, give this one to my wife because she just thought of it. But um, you know, as these as these young people are sort of aging out of our out of our our training program and our our summer health program, um, I was thinking, uh, Ms. Johnson, Ms., Ms., uh, Mr. Johnson, Ms. Goodley, et cetera, that um, 
uh, or she was thinking, and I think it's a great idea that they might, we might be able to refer them into the union training programs, the, the, those union apprenticeship programs. Um, and if there's any cost involved, maybe, maybe the uh, CRA and or the city could even assist with some of those costs. Um, because, you know, I think we're all familiar with some of those great union uh, training programs. A lot of them out there on the east, east side of town or, or, the, or that, toward that part of the county. And, uh, and then they could train on to be welders or electricians or plumbers, you know, skilled labor and even get higher, you know, higher pay when they do to enter the workforce. So just, just another great idea from my bride. And Mr. Chair, if I may, this is Vera. You recognize, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's a great idea uh, to Lynn uh, Dinkfelder uh, there, John, or Councilman Dinkfelder, I should say. Um, I, I last week at City Council, I believe, I believe it was last week, I've uh, directed city staff to draw up an ordinance to encourage the use of apprenticeships um, within city contracts. As, as, as you probably know, we, we already encourage that through certain CRA projects. And I'm looking, and I'm probably wearing my city council hat here, but um, I'm looking at transferring some form of mutually agreeable ordinance um, similar in a way to what we already do in, C in, in CRA uh, whenever it comes to encouragement of apprenticeships. Um, I, I think council members, uh, I, I heard through the grapevine, uh, may have been briefed on this from some of the uh, labor organizations and, and, uh, and what's been uh, trying to be pushed through, but that's something that we're trying to push through with great vigor on the city side to to be able to you know take these young people um who are 18 19 years old and and maybe a lot of them don't you know know what they're going to do with their lives and you put them into an apprenticeship program it could be with a union it could be with abc could be with whoever a state certified apprenticeship program and you put them on a path to be welders you put them on a path to be a carpenter or an electrician or a steel worker and you put them on a path to economic security, to health, better health security, better pension and retirement security, and really on a pathway to the middle class. Um, so that's something that we are working on, um, on under the city. Um, and the, the CRA already um, uh, does do some encouragement in that. I think it was in 2015, Councilman Suarez, uh, as I recall, uh, led the charge in that. And uh, so I just wanted to salute you on that because I think that's a great idea. We're running on that. Uh, with vigor in uh, Tampa City Council. I believe we're going to get reports back on that October 2nd um, from uh, City Legal because obviously there's right now litigation occurring in Pinellas County on um, a similar, somewhat similar ordinance. It's, it, uh, there's distinctions between what I'm proposing and this uh, litigated ordinance, but that's something that's moving forward. And I think that, you know, giving these young people a pathway to the middle class is something that we should encourage uh, with great vigor. So I just wanted to thank you for that, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other board members? Being, uh, let me if just chime in. Yes, Ms. Renault. Sorry, this is Natasha. If I just Let's wanted continue. to respond, um, we are also in the process of trying to do and implement some programs for the kids that could not get in our summer youth program. Um, even for the five positions that we created, I know several of them were held up for quite some time in with their background. So we talked about establishing a program for the, the, the youth that could not participate because of background challenges, as well as some adults. So we have, um, we discussed it at the last CAC meeting. We're having information brought back to us to um, look over and that's just something that's in the works that we are looking to try to expand. So I would definitely love to be able to expand it to doing union apprenticeship programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilley. Any other board members uh, comments? Any board members? Lena, let me just chime in. Uh, Ms. Gilley, I, I, I've known you for a while. I know how that CRA, uh, our CAC in East Tampa works. I've been on that board. I want to say you've been doing a fine job over the last couple of years moving the East Tampa CRA. Uh, it's really starting to move. You can see some of the things that are happening. Uh, as it relates to jobs, uh, I'm just looking that every kid may not be a person who can work out in the sun. So if we can look at extending that program, maybe other aspects uh, of the workforce within the city as well to help out uh, 
with our young people, it would be most uh, appreciative to look into that. Uh, so if you can just take that back to your CDC board uh, for future reference. Thank you. That's something we talked about uh, trying to create um, some type of job or program where it's not just outside and keeping the neighborhood clean. Um, I'm still, for myself, I can't think of anything. The CAC wasn't able to. So the union apprenticeship sounds like a great, um, you know, segue for them. But if there are any other ideas of positions that they could do, because ultimately whatever they're doing should be benefiting um, our footprint. You know, the kids, the kids doing the summer youth program are cleaning up right aways and trimming overhanging limbs in the street and picking up trash. So of course that goes towards the mission of um, our CRA. But if we could think of a position that they could do that still would go, would move towards that mission, um, I'm definitely open to any suggestions. Again, thank you, Ms. Gilly, for your leadership. Uh, Mr. Massey? We were at the uh, yes, sir. Um, Relative to these various initiatives, we certainly will look at them from a legal standpoint. The primary purpose, though, of the CRA is for redevelopment activities. And so, you know, how CRA funds are uh, expended need to be tied to redevelopment of East Tampa or the various different uh, CRA areas that are designated. So, uh, you know, we have to be careful how we how we do that. But we certainly will look at that um, if there's if, and I'm happy to, to discuss this further when you know, maybe next next month CRA after we had had some time to talk uh, internally and see what we can do creatively with this and we feel that it could be legally supported. Um, but that's that's the primary issue. And as I think you all are aware, unfortunately, the Florida legislature has um, amended uh, the community redevelopment laws over time in, as recently as 2019 to really limit what we can use CRA dollars for. And they've been pretty express about that. Um, so, but again, we will look at it and we'll be as creative as we possibly can. Um, and if there's no other questions or comments from, from Ms. Come, Ms. Goodley, I, I do think we, we do need to go to uh, public comment uh, next, uh, so, Mr. Chair. So. That, is, that is correct. I was going back to that. And public, please uh, uh, accept my apologies. We kind of missed over that, but we're going to get to it now. Uh, Madam Clerk, how many people do we have on the line waiting? Um, right now, we have six people on the line waiting and one recording. Okay, we can begin when you're ready. All right, thank you. The first speaker I have is Tina Swain. If you could hear me, please unmute your line and you have three minutes to speak. Uh, are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I'm Tina Swain. I'm the CEO for Habitat for Humanity of Hillsborough County, and I'm coming today to just give you some information about the wealth gap and how Habitat uh, helps to close the gap. Um, in her book, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, author Mercer Baradaran suggests that the wealth gap where historic injustice breeds present suffering. Indeed, we continue to see this in our own communities year after year. Nearly a third of black renters pay more than half of their income on housing, higher than any other racial or ethnic group, leaving little in the budget for food, healthcare, transportation, or savings. In early 2020, Brookings released data indicating that the net worth of a typical white family at $171,000 is nearly 10 times greater than the net worth of the typical black family at $17,150. These are sobering numbers. As a result, black parents have dramatically less wealth, assets, and economic security to pass on to their children, driving economic, educational, and housing disparities for the next generation as well. Not surprisingly, the gap in homeownership rates between white families at 71.9% and families at 41.8% is a significant contributor to the wealth gap. Homeownership continues to be the primary mechanism that American families use to build wealth. An analysis of Habitat for Humanity Hillsborough homes that were sold from July 2012 to June of 2018, where we took current online values and compared them to the value at the time of purchase, it showed us that the average wealth accumulated from the homes that were built during that period is $63,175 per household. 
the increased wealth accumulated by homeowners from the Habitat for Humanity affordable housing strategy is narrowing the wealth gap for minorities in Hillsborough County. Black Habitat for Humanity home buyers, who are the majority of Had Hillsborough home buyers, are building equity and generational wealth. Local public officials can play a role in promoting wealth building opportunities for minority families through a variety of public policies. When making allocations of housing related funds, elected officials should carefully consider the role that home ownership plays in wealth building. With strong population growth projected for the foreseeable future, it's reasonable for us to assume that residential real estate will continue to be a wealth building asset for families who here. By contrast, renters will not share in the wealth building enjoyed by owners of residential real estate. Given the recent focus on social injustices throughout the nation, especially as it relates to black families, it is imperative that solutions to solving the wealth gap be examined. The extent in which black families participate in homeownership wealth building will be impacted by local housing policies and funding allocations. Public officials should consider the positive role that they can play in promoting homeownership wealth building and should correspondingly ensure that a considerable portion of housing funding is aimed at homeownership. Uh, after this meeting, I will send each one of you um, a more specific call to action, different ideas on how um, we could look at policy. But I thank you all for your time and for all of the work that you're doing to help close the wealth gap. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker we have is Ardacia Floyd. If you can hear me, please unmute your line and you have three minutes. All right, we'll move on to the next speaker who is Justin Coffey. If you can hear me, please unmute your line. You have three minutes. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your time. My name is Justin Coffey. Um, I'd like to start off by giving a special thanks to Chairman Orlando Gooch for making himself available outside of these formal meetings to hear from constituents. And um, I'm here today to support Councilman uh, Bill Carlson's uh, motion on Staff Report 3 to study the effect of placing a cap on the downtown CRA that would result in excess money being placed in the general fund and redirected to CRAs of greater need for the purpose of relieving slum, blight, poverty, and the affordable housing shortage. I would like to address the importance of taking an all-encompassing approach when assessing how this money can benefit communities in need. Um, there must be a consideration of rent, transportation, and a quality of living. Uh, safe, secure housing connected to opportunity should not be treated as a market commodity. It's a basic human need, uh, a right, and a cornerstone of a prosperous, inclusive society. As noted by the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner, Housing has come to be viewed as a financial vehicle for wealthy investors instead of a social good or simply a place to live. Under international law, according to the High Commissioner's Office, to be adequately housed means having secure tenure, not having to worry about being evicted or having your home or lands taken away. It means living somewhere that is in keeping with your culture and having access to appropriate services, schools, and employment. Um, so I'd like to echo the previous speaker before me about home ownership. I, I think that is very important. Um, such housing needs to be located near public mass transit to help low income residents save money, access better jobs, improve health, and reach critical community services. Uh, affordable housing contributes to significant economic impacts, including increase in local purchasing power, job creation, and new tax revenues. Um, it also frees up funds with families uh, with tight budgets to spend on health care and food. So I'm calling for greater efforts for inclusive community redevelopment. I believe that families and individuals should be able to live in any area and not be segregated by income. Um, affordable housing to me means a place of dwelling that is maintained and of quality and is a center of, of living in a comfortable space for its occupants. Uh, I've noticed that for the fiscal year of 2020, um, downtown CRA funding was nearly $15 million and um, currently only 400,000 of the CRA's budget goes towards affordable housing. Um, that's alarming to me. Um, and 
Yes, I would just like to reiterate that I, I do support uh, Councilman Bill Carlson's uh, study. Uh, I just want to make sure that it's centered on equal access and equal opportunity. Um, thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Next speaker we have is Rachel Howard. Please unmute your line. You have three minutes. Hello, good morning. Um, like she said, my name is Rachel Howell. And uh, like Justin, I wanna voice my support for today's agenda item number three that proposes to analyze the possibility of placing a cap on the downtown CRA further and that this cap would be uh, redirected to East Tampa, Sulphur Springs and the Uptown Innovation District. Um, while I think developing the downtown area is great, uh, we can't forget Tampa's other neighborhoods. Um, many people that work downtown don't actually live there. They live in the surrounding areas and commute to the city and their neighborhoods deserve funding as well to create, you know, better public transportation, affordable and quality housing and access to nutritional foods such as grocery stores. Um, supporting these neighborhoods will benefit Tampa as a whole when we see Tampa as more than just downtown. Uh, so I believe the proposed cap funds should be go to fighting those challenges. Um, I wanna thank the council for bringing this motion forward. I think it has the potential to help bring Tampa's ideal tomorrow to more residents than it would if it were to just be used in downtown. Uh, so in conclusion, I support agenda item number three and I urge the council to move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker we have is Megan Thomas. Please unmute your line. You have three minutes. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Good morning, council members. My name is Megan. I'm a local advocate. I'm calling in to support placing a cap on downtown CRA and using that excess funding to actually address affordable housing and poverty in the areas that need it. First, I'd like to talk about how CRAs are funded. I'm not sure who would be in charge of changing this, but uh, at the least we can expose it. The fact that CRA funding is dependent on projected tax revenue increases is a problem within itself. It's a vicious cycle of funding because of course the more developed areas have higher property values and will be projected to see higher increases in property tax revenue meaning that the poorer areas will never see the investment they need because the amount CRA invests is dependent on the lower property tax revenue of these more distressed areas. It's just another broken part of a broken system that needs to change. Second, if we're going to move the excess money to these areas, we have to make sure it actually benefits the communities that already live there. Projects like the Uptown Strategic Plans Innovation Project is not it. Um, as my colleague Erdesha once pointed out before, the execu executive director of this project, Mark Sharp, he claimed that the Uptown Innovation Project is to, quote, lift up the university area, and then contradicts himself by saying that the university area is, quote, our gateway for people coming to Tampa for the first time meaning they're just trying to attract wealthy tourists and not actually benefit the people within these communities. CRA money should be carefully allocated to increase the quality of life for the people in these areas instead of investing in massive commercial projects that already have plenty of private investment and disproportionately benefit the rich. We must stop increasing the luxuries of the rich and start increasing the necessities of the poor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker we have is Roselle Coffee. Hi, uh, Council. My name is Roselle Coffee. Thank you for letting me voice my uh, opinions. Um, I am also in support of uh, this motion that everyone else has just brought up. Uh, when we think of Tampa's tomorrow, we have to consider the city as a whole. How can we most effectively ensure that each neighborhood represents Tampa? Lack of transportation, emerging food deserts, and a shortage of quality, affordable housing. These are a few of the issues that are currently the shortcomings of Tampa's tomorrow. These blights exist just outside of downtown, and I know it's a challenge that we can step up to. 
Neighborhoods like Sulphur Springs and East Tampa need attention. When we talk about affordable housing, we must be sure to include quality in front of it. I was recently reminded of the importance of that detail. We want our community to have quality, quality affordable housing, something people will not only live in, but will own. Investing in our people is the same thing as investing in our city. Accessible public transportation is another huge factor in improving these neighborhoods, ensuring that people can make it to school and work. Everyone can sleep better knowing that they have a reliable and safe transportation. Quality food options are also um, a need of com communities outside of downtown. Um, there are food deserts all throughout Tampa. Um, these, these are things that we can address now. And I feel this cap that Carlson and Maniscalco uh, brought up, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. So thank you for your time. And I hope we can get that going. Thank you. Thank you. I will go back to Erdacia Floyd. Please unmute your line and you have three minutes. All right, Chair, um, I don't know what's going on. She is on, but she's not unmuting herself. So I do want to add that we had other two other speakers that requested to speak live. However, they did not attend the webinar, and that is Joseph McLennan and Alicia Sastre. And Chair, that will conclude the live public comments, and I will proceed with playing the recorded message. Thank you, Madam Deputy Clerk. Good morning. My name is Sophia. I live in the Sulphur Springs neighborhood in Tampa. I am calling in support of Staff Report 3 to provide a report to analyze the possibility of placing a cap on downtown CRA spending and shifting extra money to areas like East Tampa, Uptown, and Sulphur Springs to address an affordable housing shortage. Up until now, Tampa hasn't done enough to address poverty. Instead of helping citizens maintain their way of life after hard times like the 2008 recession, Tampa allowed rents to skyrocket and displace thousands of residents from public housing. We saw a slum and blight shift from one area of the map to another. Some of these newly populated areas that are continuously underfunded have a 40% poverty rate and rent is still only increasing. Overall, Tampa currently has a 19% poverty rate. Are we going to see another poverty explosion on the map after COVID has finished stalling the American economy? I think Staff Report 3 is the first step in the right direction to help citizens maintain their way of life. I don't want to see any more Tampanians displaced. I'm supporting this motion with the hopes of extra funding going to quality affordable housing projects in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do want to announce that Joseph McLennan has join the webinar and I'm going to call on him. If you could hear me, please unmute your line. You have three minutes. Mr. McLennan, please unmute your line. Call him one more time, Deputy Clerk. Mr. McLennan, please unmute your line. You have three minutes to speak. Okay, seems like Mr. McLennan is having some, some difficulties. Do we have anybody else we want to get to No, that will conclude the public comments portion of the agenda. Okay, then we'll move on to item number two. Ms. Van Long. Good morning again, Chair and CRA Board members, Michelle Van Bone, Community Redevelopment Department. Uh, this morning uh, for our staff report, um, Ed Johnson is excused from this morning's meeting. Ed is the opening speaker at a joint Florida Brownfields and Florida Redevelopment Association uh, seminar this morning. And so uh, he won't be able to join us. And Jeanette Fenton uh, will also not be able to join us this morning. I did want to take this time to publicly thank uh, Jeanette Fenton for coming back and assisting us for the past five months. Not only was she able to do so because of her obvious past association in holding the job and everything that she's done for West Tampa and Drew Park, 
but also mostly because of her participation and remaining involved in our West Tampa and Jew Park communities, attending meetings, even attending our subcommittee meetings, that her interest and support of our communities has not waned at all in the past three years. And so Jeanette was able to seamlessly come in and support us all while we transitioned to a new manager for that position. And at the end of this report, we will introduce our new uh, Jew Park and West Tampa CRA manager and we'll let him uh, introduce himself to all of you. So with that said, um, I will be starting off our monthly staff report. So we'll start with West Tampa. Uh, as mentioned, uh, our subcommittee meetings in West Tampa have been happening monthly. We have been doing it virtually and our subcommittees are also meeting again virtually. Uh, as we see, um, with the, we've talked about previously with the overlay district, I wanna thank Carlos Ramirez and his subcommittee team and the public that has been attending those meetings. Uh, they did another presentation at our last West Tampa CAC meeting last week about what those changes are. They've been working very diligently with our land use and development folks to keep moving the overlay updates through our uh, amendment cycle. And uh, the first set of those amendments will be on the next cycle for approval. And then they will have some additional uh, amendments that will come after that in the cycle after that to address some of the architectural styles and historic preservation. As noted, West Tampa is a historic district and we have a lot of historic buildings and contributing buildings. And we want very much future redevelopment to be in alignment and complement the existing development within West Tampa. Uh, with the One Tampa Fund, uh, next month I'll be able to have all the final figures. Uh, the CRAs don't get charged until everything has been paid out. And with some of, the, if a one applicant has a bill that still hasn't been paid out or a landlord that hasn't submitted all the paperwork yet, we don't see those charges yet. So by our September 10th meeting, I will have the final report for round of the businesses and we'll be able to true up all those last numbers. Uh, we are also working uh, regularly as we do every month in communicating with all our CACs and our email distribution lists and our neighborhood groups to get out information about support, both at the county and the city level, anything that happens at the state level, uh, and uh, any updates that the city sends out, we're constantly sending out to our communities. Hopefully they're not starting to get email fatigue as we keep trying to reach out to them and keep them updated. We are finalizing the content for our very first West Tampa CRA newsletter and a uh, big shout out to uh, Tina Young for uh, helping us with that and taking the lead. And uh, she has just been a phenomenal uh, member of our CAC in leading that effort. And we are greatly appreciative for all of her efforts there also. Some of our indirect activities in West Tampa, Tico is starting phase one of an underground distribution list that is running along Rome. It will go from Nassau and end at the West River. And that project will be starting shortly and then in the fall they will start replacing the poles along habana avenue and again as any traffic interruptions due to the trucks being out in the roadway to replace those poles we will keep the property owners and the people in neighborhoods up to date about the timing of the traffic changes tampa height uh, tampa housing authority continues their construction on their seven-story apartment building at the west river project we're very excited about all of the apartments that will be coming on and these are mixed use. So many of the buildings have retail and different spaces on the first floor that can be used by county services along with the support services needed by the residents there. And we're hoping that by going into fall of next year, we'll have nearly 400 new families that will be a mix of affordable and market rate apartments uh, occupying those spaces which will also again help our support our local businesses, especially along Main Street. Many of our West Campus small businesses did suffer when we saw so many residents leave the area. We are now seeing the site prep work continuing for the construction of a new uh, 200 unit apartment complex that is across the street from the Glazer Jewish Community Center and the Villa Brothers Park. 
And so uh, West Tampa is a great example how we are seeing uh, an incredible mix of an incredible mix of housing at all levels of the market. And lastly, we have the phase two of the Green Spine Cycle Track. It's the 2.6 miles that will go from Cass Street. It will connect through downtown and it will connect West Tampa and East Tampa, ending up at Cascade and Park. And that cycle track, the third phase, we're in the second phase. The third phase will then be the part that goes up Nuncio up to Cascade and Park. Lastly, our Cypress Street Outfall Stormwater Project is currently between Willow and Rome. And again, uh, the contractor is doing a great job of notifying the people in the blocks affected by any street closures or street uh, traffic disruptions and in the area. And if we can have the PowerPoint uh, advanced up to Dew Park, thank you. So before I move on to Dew Park, are there any questions about West Tampa? Uh, yes, Mr. Okay. Chairman. We recognize the Dew Park. Thanks, sir. Um, Michelle, I think I either read or you just you just spoke to um, uh, the CAC working on the revisions to the overlay. Yes, sir. And I know that eventually they'll come to council as uh, you know as, as draft you know draft changes and that sort of thing. But I was I was wondering if, if there's anything of significance that jumped out at you that you that you could mention. Uh, or are these just little minor tweaks? Uh, right now, it's consistency and minor tweaks. Some of it addresses fencing, uh, trying to address chain link fencing in front yards. Uh, everything obviously will be grandfathered in, but it's starting to work towards a more uniform look and to codifying a more uniform look. Uh, some of it is about alleyways, uh, where location of uh, consistency of location of, sorry, give me a second for the word, garages <laughs> and carports. <laughs> sorry, I, I, I'm still in slow mo. Um, so they want to make sure that new development uh, continues to follow the development pattern that is consistent within the neighborhoods. And Carlos has, uh, Mr. Ramirez has a wonderful summary, and we can certainly forward that to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, moving on to Drew Park, uh, the Tampa Bay Boulevard Linear Park construction. Um, we're right at the end. We did a walkthrough of the punch list. Uh, we're very excited about this park because as part of the greater master streetscaping plan that we completed a few years ago, which was a big community effort to develop that, for the Drew Park community, the Tampa Bay Linear Park connects the north-south uh, linear beautiful park area and sidewalks of Air Cargo Road, then coming down to Tampa Bay Boulevard, and then going back to the wonderful work we did to redo Lois, when we also added the wider sidewalks, the bikeways, uh, the pedestrian lighting, and the uh, landscaping. So now we have this one, we will have this wonderful U-shaped connectivity for anybody who wanted to bike ride or jog or take any other uh, you know, way of exercising or enjoying those areas. Whereas before you were traversing these little narrow streets that are very heavy, commercialized and industrialized, a lot of open ditches that were not very conducive to anybody uh, either walking for work uh, or just using the area for leisure and parks and recreation. So this piece of the puzzle connects the bottom of the U. And so it's a very key piece to connecting the longer trail that the community planned for itself. On the Drew Park Strategic Action Update, uh, as mentioned, East Tampa is currently doing theirs and Drew Park is also. We have our first virtual community meeting plan for August 27th. And our consultant is also developing an interactive website to also be able to add some extra interconnectivity to our community and add ways to get the information out, make the presentations, 
and allow people to give us back their comments and their feedback. We also, again, communication with our CACs. Now that we are getting back with the strategic plan update and we have projects moving forward, we are seeing our CAC members in the community starting to re-engage again. It had been a little slow during the COVID as many of our Drew Park members are very small business people who run their own businesses and their ability to participate in our community work the past few months has been challenging. So we're glad to see more of them being able to re-engage as we move forward, especially with our strategic plan update. And lastly, we did have five Drew Park businesses so far that participated in the One Tampa uh, Business Relief Program Part 2. For indirect, uh, we are now seeing construction of CAE. We're very excited. This is on Air Cargo Road, and while it is outside the CRA, it is across the street from our CRA boundary and will bring 600 people coming to and from and going through our Drew Park community. So we hope that at least some of these employees will find some of our wonderful small restaurants and little coffee shops and some of the businesses that help support building materials and car supplies and fix it shops and that our small businesses will find a new customer base with the addition of all the employees coming to and from that location. So while it isn't a CRA business, we're hoping that being adjacent to the CRA will have an impact on our small businesses. And lastly, we are very excited about the Two Shepherds Tap Room. If anyone hasn't gone and seen the pictures online, it is an indoor-outdoor dog park. And it's our only one that's connected with a bar. And uh, so far, even with COVID, we've been very excited about what that looks like and what this means uh, for the Drew Park community. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about Drew Park. I have no idea. Hearing none, I will turn it over to Courtney Orr to discuss our EBOR updates. Yes, hi, good morning. This is Courtney Orr, the CRA manager for Ybor City CRA 1 and 2. And uh, we've been putting some effort into marketing and communications to those within and outside the district to make sure people understand that we are open, there are businesses open, obviously not the bars and the nightclubs, however, restaurants, retail, we're still open, lights are on. And so a couple of the initiatives that we've put forth just in this last week we have mailed approximately 1,100 postcards to residents and businesses all around our EBOR CRA 1 and 2, encouraging them that they register to start to receive our communications um, and register on eborcityonline.com so that they can start to see uh, activities that are happening and all the COVID-19 resources that we post on a, on a daily basis, basically. Um, but we are consistently reaching out via flash, daily social media postings. Another effort that we have done, uh, there was a request by a board member, YCDC board member, to uh, thank our frontline workers. And we developed Motivational Monday versus, or via social media. And what we do is we are posting historical photos every Monday with some sort of inspirational quote to, to recognize that you know, Ebor has been through tough times before what, that we've prospered. Um, we now also, um, this one seems to be a hit that launched yesterday. We are asking for residents and uh, business operators to send photos of what it looks like outside of their window. So if they're just on the inside of their business or the inside of their home, they take a picture of what view they're seeing outside their window um, or a video. So uh, we launched it on social media and very quickly got some beautiful photographs. So we'll start to display those. But the whole point being that people unfortunately cannot come to visit us right now. So we'll try to bring the views of Ybor City to them. Uh, and you'll start to hear more and more about the Archway Light Project. We're, we're continuing to move that forward and we should hopefully be in front of the Barrio Latino Commission, I'm hoping in the next um, next few months, but by the end of 2020 to get approval of the Archway Light Project to finally move it forward directly after uh, Super Bowl. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we've been, again, uh, communicating every executive order that comes out. We have an ambassador program, so the ambassador uh, has been out um, hand delivering things just to make just to ensure that we're getting the notices out um, if people aren't getting them via um, electronic communications and we're, we're actually doing it on a, in a in-person uh, delivery. Our marketing and communication services RFP that you all were able to review before it went out on the street did have a deadline and we have received five five interested uh, firms that would like to be our Ebor City CRA uh, marketing and PR contractor. So we'll be reviewing the five and evaluating those. Our first meeting with internal staff to, to discuss and, and try to select the best one is uh, August 24th. So um, that's to be coming forward to get approval by city council um, due to its, its expenditure amount. And uh, in our planning infrastructure and economic development subcommittee, uh, we were talking about brick streets. Brick streets are um, a hot topic for the for the group right now, and they're trying to just evaluate how we can bring bricks back and and you know what what financial um, opportunities there are if it's grants or um, whatever the case may be, but how maybe other cities have approached. Uh, sourcing brick and, and the correct brick and, and affording the cost of, of trying to bring brick back into the district. Uh, the, there are 20 special event co-sponsorship grants that were received. We had a deadline of July 27th and 20 event um, applications were received this afternoon actually from one to five o'clock. Uh, just like we do on an annual basis, we have a committee from our board that sits and uh, discusses uh, in a trans very transparent format, we have all the applicants come in who would like to come in and listen to the discussion. And then if the, if the group has any questions, they'll ask the questions to the applicant directly if they're present. But at the end, we determine which special events do qualify and then how much of funding, how much of the funding that's available do they receive based on the request that was made. And that's actually, so that's again this afternoon. Uh, we've been communicating lift up local information. It was extended to August 31st, as you know, and so we did communicate that immediately so that the restaurants would know to continue using uh, the sidewalk, which they which they very much appreciate. And, and final slide, um, we have been, we met with them actually the, the Ebor Merchants Association Executive Board asked for a meeting with the mayor to discuss the district holiday season that's on everyone's radar um, being mid-August planning starts usually for the snow on seventh parade so there was just um, concern from the group that should effort be put into that um, monumental task if in fact parades and other events still are not um, able to be permitted so uh, we had a discussion and, and how we can proceed with the holiday season effectively to still bring some some good spirit to the district and um, that kind of that pretty much concludes. There's a uh, there was a presentation. We we asked some um, a county representative to speak to us uh, committee about the rapid response recovery grant program. We're just trying to let the businesses know of what the city of Tampa opportunities are for funding relief, but and and also the county. So we're just we're really trying to get that information out so people take advantage of those funding opportunities. And then if you get a chance, there's a beautiful new block right across from the, the new hotel that is uh, anticipated to open September 24th, um, Hotel Aya, that should be opening September 24th, as, that I heard as of yesterday. And um, across this, on the south side, directly across the street, there's a, uh, all the hexagon, hexagon, hexagon and red brick pavers were replaced. So um, that's a beautiful, looking street uh, or block i mean and, and we hope to to um, replicate that further down seventh avenue as monies are um, available and so uh, that'll be another enhancement project infrastructure enhancement project that we'd like to continue so if you get a chance please check it out and that concludes my report thank you thank you
Are there any questions for Courtney before we move on to East Tampa? Mr. Chair, if I may. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Ms. Orr, at the uh, gateway uh, on the east side, is Ms. Uh, Fran Constantino happy about this? Extremely, extremely. She <laughs> just wanted it done in her lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and we're there, we're, we're, and so far so good. <laughs> She's still well, with us. We all know if Fran's happy, everybody's happy. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Orr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. You recognize, sir. Thank you. Um, good morning, Courtney. Um, you probably heard the discussion earlier about um, the East Tampa Youth Program and, and the possibility of expanding it, Courtney. Um, I, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, do you think you have uh, uh, that type of youth, uh, that age, et cetera, um, in your district, maybe over on the east end or, or, what, or whatever, or perhaps up in the north end, um, that might benefit from that? And how do you think the CAC might accept that idea? Yeah, I, I don't know how much um, I'd have to look back at our last resident worker survey to, to see actually how many families there are with children. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's a significant number. However, Shore Elementary is, you know, right in the middle of the district. So um, if there's got to be a lot of families that live on the periphery or directly within the district that send their children to Shore Elementary. So there could be some, you know, good candidates that have you know and they have siblings so there could, could be some potential candidates for for a youth related program and, and i'm sure my our cac would would uh would think that's great because i know that we do want more uh families with children you know in the district um we've talked about trying to get playground equipment someplace in the district whenever we can acquire some open space and some green space so um, I think that they would definitely be supportive of that to, to you know, help empower our youth and, and as long as we have the participating um, demographics, I think so. How, how far, how far to the, to the east does the, uh, one of those CRAs uh, extend? To 26, 26th Street. So there's, there's, okay. We have residential pockets, you know, we, our CRA2 is definitely um, what we consider to be more of our residential CRA. Um, so that would have all the all the housing over on the far east side up to 26th Street, and then the park, the, the pocket up around the um, VME board, the German American Club, and of course south, south of, you know, 5th, 4th and 5th. And so so I, we have so many residential units also online that we don't we don't know what that's going to help bring in in regard to uh, a younger demographic in our district. So we're hopeful for that. So we think that with all these units online, that um, we're inevitably going to have more youth in the district. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to East Tampa. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go for the other one. So as um, Ms. Goodley talked about and has brought up, we do have our East Tampa Clean Team and Youth Employment Program for the summer. Uh, we hired 42 youth this year. It is our 14th year. And you can see some of the stats of how um, these young adults are helping us with East Tampa and helping to remediate slum and blight in East Tampa. Um, our, we have been continuing our CAC and subcommittee meetings virtually uh, throughout the COVID, and we do continue to work with um, the developers and potential housing projects, and we are hoping this fall that there will be a new project in the private sector announced. So um, even with COVID, we are still seeing the private sector is still coming and talking to us and still moving forward, and there is still some capital out there. Uh, we've heard a lot about our tree trimming program. Um, in 2020, we funded 100,000, and uh, that is nowhere near going to be enough for the volume that we're at. At uh, 200 applicants, we would be at 500,000 
at the last CAC meeting for East Tampa. Uh, they did uh, vote to add 400,000 and reprogram it for a total of 500,000. Uh, that we will definitely go past the 100,000 before the fiscal year is up. So their meeting was after our SIRE deadline. So at the September meeting, we will be coming back with that reprogramming. Uh, now, since uh, Ed put this together two weeks ago, uh, we do have uh, approximately 200 applications of people from East Tampa. You see a lot of those other inquiries. Uh, Ed has been having to go through well over 400 applications that we get all the way from Lutz and Valrico and Riverview. So anyone heard about the program, just like with any other incentive, a lot of people, um, if it's an easy application, everyone just decides it's worth the five or 10 minutes just to see what they might be able to get. But Ed does have to go through all of those, verify all the addresses when we do get those. Um, we have appreciated all the efforts by code enforcement and our uh, other city departments that have been helping us get the word out and also going and looking at the trees and also looking at who may have code violations because of trees and yard uh, overgrowth that uh, they're also code enforcement has been letting those residents know about the program. And as discussed earlier, uh, we have been overwhelmed with the response. It came very fast and very furious. And the current city contract does not have enough vendors on it. And we would like to expand that vendor pool. And at the same time, also see how we can also help some of our minority and at-risk businesses. The way the current program reads, it says that we are using the city contract and East Tampa tree trimming businesses. Unfortunately, there are many landscaping companies out there, but not all these landscaping companies are uh, provide the services needed for tree trimming and tree removal. So I am requesting that the CRA board uh, pass a motion that allows us to expand our business vendor pool to our Wimby and small businesses beyond the East Tampa CRA in order to increase our pool to meet the needs of our residents in a timely manner. And if there are any questions, I do believe that we might have Greg Spearman on the line. Uh, purchasing has been working with us and Gregory Hart in Minority Business Development to reach out to our minority businesses to find out who is out there, who do, truly does tree trimming services to see what that pool would be. And if CRA board should pass this motion, purchasing and the Minority Business Development Office are ready to go out with a sheltered solicitation for Wimby and small businesses to be able to get on a city contract to provide the tree trimming services for this program. Um, so they're ready to do that uh, within a, a day or two of CRA board making that motion. So um, before this meeting it out, I will request that that motion be at least made for consideration. Uh, lastly, in East Tampa, our affordable housing program, we heard many speakers earlier during public comment uh, talk about the importance of home ownership. Through the Urban 360 program and the partnership with Domain Homes, 74 houses have been built. Uh, of those 74, 63 of those homes have already been purchased and closed. 10 units uh, have been sold and are currently under construction and one unit is for sale. So we're very proud of those numbers and how quickly those uh, homes are uh, in the hands now of families and home ownership. Uh, there's a lot of comments about, okay, but who's buying these homes? Of those uh, 63 homes already purchased and closed on, or actually 73, over 74% of the homeowners are African American and at least 20% of those are 20% AMI or below. So when we talk about affordable homes, it truly is people who are benefiting from our down payment assistance and our other housing uh, programs to be able to afford these homes and to bring some of our uh, lower income people into home ownership and again building that wealth over time for themselves and their family. Habitat Homes Hillsboro uh, has also sold eight homes and they have two additional ones under construction. The CDC of Tampa also completed and sold three homes and two are under construction. And in addition to that, uh, domain homes, uh, we talk so much about East Tampa and what would the private sector do without incentives. On top of the homes that domain built under their 360 program, 
they've purchased an additional 41 properties on their own uh, as part of the private market to continue to provide additional affordable housing in East Tampa. So in the past 12, 12 or 14 months or so, we have seen an incredible amount of single family home building in the East Tampa and more than we've seen in about the past 10 years. So this is a very exciting time right now for East Tampa. Next slide. Our uh, 34th Street project, which goes from Columbus to East Hillsboro, uh, that is a city contract. Uh, that has been going along very quickly. We've been very happy with the progress and the faster it goes, the less disruption to the uh, people moving through the area and the residents and the neighborhoods. So this construction began on March 2nd and uh, now at the beginning of August, they have already completed the roundabout at East 20 First Avenue intersection and it is now open uh, and they are currently working on the roundabouts at East Lake Avenue and Osborne. Uh, we uh, are very grateful from our support for Rob and I and Melissa Davies as we are looking and uh, they've been working with our CAC to develop public art for those three roundabouts and looking at artists that can bring us artwork that is reflective of our community and fits into the culture and heritage of our East Tampa community. Um, we are about 50% complete on construction. We do expect substantial completion. We're still on schedule for December 2020 with final contract closeout in February. Uh, lastly, our East Tampa strategic action plan update. Our contractor re-engaged now after doing their due diligence with our CAC uh laying out our next steps and our process and we're setting up all the meetings with the contractor in our internal department so the contractor can get up to date with what the city departments have planned uh in the cip over the next five years and to uh, do an assessment of the conditions of our infrastructure and our land use and zoning and how all that ties in so the next several months will be spent on all of that so with that, I'll complete East Tampa and I can answer any questions. Ms. Ms. Van Long, uh, yes, the sir. project, the, round, the roundabout project, I can tell you, I know there was a little opposition to it, uh, but a lot of the residents who live in the area have contacted me and say uh, it has made a, tra a transition to the community. It is beautifying the area. I've driven through there myself and seen the actual beautification of that area so i'm just be glad when the project gets completed with a lot of flowers and uh, uh, some artwork around them uh, to really make that area pop because i think it is really making a difference uh, having that project on 34th street and we look forward to a wonderful february day when we can all uh show up for a dedication of our new roadway and roundabouts and we'll plan for great weather and seeing our cra board there for that Thank you. Thank you. You're recognized, sir. Mr. Chairman. You're recognized. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, um, you, you, Mr. Chairman, you read you read my mind. Um, I know we in a couple of different meetings, both at the city and the CRA, we spoke to the fact that the Bay Shore for many, many years has been landscaped, beautified, amazing flowers year round, that sort of thing. And I think council made it abundantly clear that especially with the help of, of some of the state money, as well as our own local money, that at the end of these projects, um, that not only for the short term, but for the long term, that those projects in East Tampa have the same type of amazing beautification, flowers, shrubbery, et cetera, uh, maintained by, by, the, uh, by the city uh, for forever. And um, so I, I hope that that's, that's part of the project. I hope that's where we're headed. I hope there's good irrigation uh, because obviously that's a critical 
component in Florida uh, to keep those flowers looking amazing. And I hope that there's a long-term maintenance plan. Uh, Mr. Bennett, I think, uh, sp has spoken to equity on numerous occasions, and I think this is a, an important part of, of equity. Um, so, um, Michelle, if you have anything to add to that, uh, that, that would be great. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, this is Carlson. Could I add to that? You're recognized, sir. Uh, just, just for anybody who's <clears throat> who's listening who might not have heard these discussions before, you know there is an economic development reason to make sure there's equity. There's a humanitarian and a civil rights perspective, but there's also an economic development one. And uh, it, it, from what I can see in the news, we're still slated to have the Super Bowl come. And when people come in from out of town, they walk around and they look at our city. And uh, in particular, they like to people who visit a city like to look at the best parts of the city and what might can be considered the worst parts. And we need to make sure that all parts of our city look good. And, and in particular, um, the Super Bowls, uh, I think, draw a lot of um, African-American entrepreneurs. And uh, we want them to invest in our community. And we want the people from around the world who are coming to invest in our community. And we need to make sure that our whole community looks good. I had the Prime Minister of Singapore come visit years ago. And um, when we were taking the bus, there. Um, uh, uh, as we were driving through certain areas, we had to try to distract the people because not every area looks as great as certain areas. And you, you, we can't just present one face. We need to assume that people can drive wherever. It's a free country. They can drive wherever they want. And they're going to see whatever they want. And if we if we spend a small amount of money uh, making our city look good, and it, it helps our residents, first of all, to feel proud about their community, um, but also uh, it will help attract investment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Long, you said you want to come back with the tree uh, uh, notion uh, a little later on, or you want to do that now? If you're ready to do it now, that would be perfectly uh, fine while we're on the topic of East Tampa. Thank you. Can I get anyone to uh, make a motion in reference to Ms. Long's request for the uh, amendment to the current uh, Contract for the tree. Most of Mr. Dingfeld. for a second. Any second? Second. Second, Carlson. Most of Mr. Dingfeld. Most of Mr. Dingfeld. So, Mr. Carlson. Any discussion? Any discussion? Mr. Hello, I just want to make sure that we are going to be. Uh, having a good effort at reference to looking for minority contractors uh, within this new amendment, correct? Yes, sir. We have Mr. Uh, Hart or Mr. Spearman on the line. Yes, Gregory Hart, Equal Business Opportunity on the line. Hey, I'm good morning. Greg Spearman is also on the line. Good morning, gentlemen. You, you two are now, uh, apparently now are familiar with this tree grant. Just want to hear what your position is on it and how we're going to go forward to make sure this is going to happen. Well, this is Gregory Hart, Equal Business Opportunity. Uh, we have um, already generated a very robust list of firms certified by the city as being small and or minority owned. So that will be um, a, a, a great resource to, to, to um, refer to. Additionally, and Mr. Spearman can speak to this, um, <clears throat> there's already been um, uh, an outreach um, uh, plan crafted and actually um, underway, but I'll let Mr. Spearman speak to that as well, whereby um, purchasing is identifying the the requisite uh, criteria, um, licenses, et cetera, that will be necessary uh, to do tree trimming. I would like to say that <clears throat> from the EBO office standpoint, I can tell you that a big roadblock for small and minority businesses alike is that there was and may still be a requirement to have a licensed arborist. Um, we've, you know, we, we'd be hard pressed to find many, uh, if anybody in the underrepresented zip codes or, or database that will um, have uh, the, um, an arborist um, on, their, on their staff or their small business. So um, if that remains a requirement, I'm just curious to know whether or not um, 
uh, a city arborist or someone could be made available or identified for these small and minority businesses to utilize um, to augment their um, um, meeting the uh, criteria, whatever that might be. So just a sidebar comment there. Well, I'll that probably as a, as a roadblock. I've already, I already see that probably as a roadblock already, uh, Mr. Hart. So I think this fell on and you guys may need to get together in reference to that so we don't have that particular roadblock in there. So we can go forward. Mr. Chair, I'm Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Dingfeld, recognize. Yeah, I, um, why don't we just include it as an additional? Um, I think it's a good point, Mr. Hart, and we appreciate it. Um, why don't we include it in, in the motion um, that the city arborist, if uh, that that for you know for for the EBO. Um, community or, or, or maybe for the, you know, for the entire community uh, for this program, the city arborists would um, assist and we could waive the requirement for a uh, private arborist. Not just sort of modify the program on the fly like that. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, uh, Greg Stimmer, purchasing director. I want to echo what uh, Mr. Hart has said uh, with regard to the list that his office has developed, uh, that we can certainly uh, issue the requirements, you know, to become a um, city citywide tree trimmer. He has a rather comprehensive list, and he is absolutely correct. There is um, an arborist requirement in the existing contract that we have uh, for tree trimming, and these are requirements that were developed by the City of Tampa Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, not only does it include the arborist requirements, which probably will be a big challenge, but we also have other requirements in terms of uh, experience, equipment, uh, permitting, those kind of things. So um, we are prepared to work to move forward to bring about uh, as many of these terms as we possibly can, um, working with our Parks and Recreation Department uh, in terms of, you know, uh, any adjustments that we can make in the requirements. The main thing that we want to be sure of is that these firms uh, do have some experience, they do have equipment, they do have the labor, and uh, most importantly, that they do have insurance because they're going to be uh, cutting trees and trimming trees under the city program. But we want to make sure that at least those minimum requirements are in place uh, as we uh, as we move forward. So. Uh, with that, um, you know, I'll go ahead and yield to further discussion on the topic. Anyone else on discussion? Um, Mr. Oh. Chairman, um, what, what do you think or what does staff or Mr. Massey think about the possibility just for the purposes? We have a very unique program, uh, sort of prototypical program in the CRA that Mr. Chairman uh, created or helped, you know, started, and I think maybe we can just modify it without messing with the entire city program. We could just modify our program to specifically require um, the city, you know, or request that the city staff arborists participate in this, and we would waive the requirement for private ar, you know, the, for the private companies to have their own arborists. And I, I, I would think, Mr. Massey, that we could, uh, you know, that we could modify the, uh, our program uh, specifically along those lines without, I'm, I would hope, without coming back to council uh, just by motion today. This is Morris Massey. Hey. Councilman Dingfelder, um, I think certainly the CRA could request um, the, the city um, Land Development Coordination Office, Natural Resources Section, who has the arborist on staff, whether they would be willing to assist and participate in the and program, and whether but if they have that capacity. Um, I, I mean, I think that's what you could do today. Um, uh, I, I don't think you can. We can require that, or uh, or tell the the Natural Resources Section that they will do that. But we can certainly ask, and we'll need to talk to them and see what their capacity is. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll take the original motion as as suggested by, by Ms. Van Loan and, and just add on the additional clause that we will ask the city arborist 
to participate in this program. And if they're able to, in that case, we would be able to waive that requirement for the private arborists. Mr. Marsh, Mr. Massey, one question on, on this, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what I'm concerned about is the, the number of applications we have at this point. I, I hear Maybe you, and, 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 I, and Ms. Van Loan is concerned as well. I, I'm not sure we do have that internal capacity to handle that. Um, so, and we, and unfortunately, we can't waive the tree code either. That not the CRA board can't do that. Um, we will certainly, you know, if there's some gaps we can fill in and assist in some way, we can ask to see if there is some capacity to do that. But I, you know, that I, I don't know whether that's going to be feasible or not. This is I, Michelle. I just, I, this is Michelle Van Loan. It's also not an all or nothing proposition. Uh, some will be, and some can go through the cell certified arborist program. Um, I think our people will certainly help companies go through there. So as long as we have a mix, our arborists may or may not be able to pick. They can't do it all, but if we can get a mix of companies that may or may not need that um, and, and get a hybrid model, I, I just don't know what our you know, we'd have to talk to land use, we'd have to talk to purchasing and find out what the implications are to try and see if we can take advantage of as many companies as possible. But I don't think our arborists uh, with just a few on staff in addition to their current jobs can take on 200, a list of 200 uh, properties and growing all the time. Uh, so we'd have to have that discussion with them, but we will certainly have that discussion to see how creative and what kind of a hybrid model we might be able to come up with. Mr. Chair, this, uh, uh, this is uh, Greg Spear, the purchasing director. Uh, we currently have an existing uh, citywide uh, tree contract in place, and uh, this may help to augment or supplement some of the need that may uh, be in existence with some of the applications to get those out of backlog. Uh, we currently have four firms that are covered on the contract. Uh, Pete and Ron's Tree Service, Payne's Environmental, which happens to be a City of Tampa certified small local business enterprise. Uh, we have Mid-America Tree Service and we also have Arbor Pro. So I'm, I'm not sure what their capacity is at this point in terms of uh, how they're being utilized by the city. We can certainly look into that, but if it would help in the interim to alleviate some of the backlog on uh, on the application, um, this may be a good alternative while we go through this process of, um, you know, potentially looking at um, other firms that uh, we may bring into the program. Thank you, Mr. Spearman. I just, I guess my, my biggest concern is making sure that we are advertising uh, to some of the uh, African American businesses. Uh, I'm hearing complaints that they didn't know about the program, how they can get involved. There's nothing on the website uh, seeing how they can get involved to be a part of this project. Uh, so that's one concern I have, making sure that we're actually getting the word out for those small uh, minority African-American companies that probably be a part of the program. Number two, if it is going to be an East Tampa program and we're backlog and you can help and maybe uh, uh, the, the city of Arborist can help, I think maybe the CRA, the CAC may need to look at also within that, that, that grant, looking at an, an, an arborist as well, part-time arborist or somebody to be able to help with this backlog because the, the, the applications are still coming in. Uh, I don't know how much longer that money will last, but I know there is a big, big backlog of people that are waiting. And I just wanna make sure that we can get this thing moving as fast as we can. Storms are coming and uh, people have been waiting a long, long time. So I wanna make sure we can get this thing moving as fast as we can. Understood. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hart. Mr. Spear? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I understand you, um, Councilman Goose, and we will work uh, with uh, Parks and Recreation, the Arborist Land Use, um, based on the comments made by Mr. Massey and Ms. Van Long, to, um, to move as expeditious as we possibly can. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm okay with the changes that, um, that uh, Mr. Dingfelder put forward. Thank you, sir. In my second. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Madam Clerk, can you take the roll? Sierra? 
Yes. Booth? Booth? Yes. Bing Calder? Yes. Ernie Scoggle? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Cedro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move on to item number three. Staff work. Uh, we, uh, Chair, we have uh, downtown and Rob Rosner's uh, reports to finish up, and then we can move okay. on to number three. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead and continue. Rob? What? Mr. Rosner, you there? Yes, my desk phone wasn't working, so I switched to another. My apologies. No, oh, sorry, phone, sir, no problem. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, please. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to report on the uh, downtown first. Uh, the first item we have are the Tampa Convention, uh, Tampa Convention Center renovations. Uh, we received nine submittals from the committee and uh, the Skanska team was selected and uh, they're the design build firm for all the renovation. Uh, that kickoff meeting happened a week ago and we're working with contracts admin uh, doing the, the initial uh, agreement paperwork and getting the, the scope of work um, starting to be clearly defined and that paperwork will be coming to you probably in the first week of October. Um, if not a little bit earlier. Right now, it looks like we've got, you know, a fair amount of work to do to get the scope completely written uh, in detail. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to move on to the uh, river walk and at the Strive. Uh, I don't have any photos for you at the moment. Would be interesting enough to look at, but uh, the uh, wall that was approved, uh, or the wall that we approved the additional money for, is being constructed right now. Uh, as of a week ago. The rebar was in place and the uh, and the forming for the walls was being done. I'm, I'm sure it's been poured by now. I haven't been out there this week yet. So um, with that, um, they're fairly on schedule with all the other pieces of it. We have uh, had probably about a two week delay because of uh, just normal COVID issues and, and labor issues with uh, uh, people not being able to come or they got quarantined or something to that effect. So for the most part, we're still on schedule to be done with all the road work and all the phases in uh, mid, uh, late October to mid November. So next slide, please. Indirect activities, uh, Water Street, Tampa. Um, the JW Marriott is on track to be uh, open by Super Bowl. They uh, intend to have their CO complete by December and uh, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll have things that they'll be working on up to the day of Super Bowl, I'm sure, but they'll get their substantial completion and their CO up on Super Bowl. Um, they are turning it over to Marriott to start outfitting in September. So all, most of the floors are complete. Um, of course, Marriott has their own uh, quality standards that they make sure things are before they have anybody stay at the hotel. Um, one of the two cranes is now being dismantled. If you didn't get a chance to see some of that, um, when they dismantle cranes, it usually takes a whole day and, and we have to close streets for doing that. The 1001 office building and garage uh, next door uh, have both popped out structurally um, and they are uh, skinning the building now and uh, they should be dried in and they're on schedule for that. Uh, a couple of these buildings will be online uh, shortly after Super Bowl between March and June, uh, depending on which portions they release first. But they're, you know, communicating with us on a weekly basis about when they'll have certain COs done, when some of the public realm will be completed, and where they're at with the uh, master infrastructure. Um, we are starting to talk about their phase three of their master plan, which is the uh, mill site um, and what they're going to do there next. They had some preliminary plans, but they're still working on more concrete plans now and, and weighing out options. Um, so that's the area just north of Cumberland uh, that we're talking about. The residential tower for the H1 block is ahead of construction uh, schedule, and they're very happy about that. 
and um, I'll move on. Next door to Hyatt House um, and Hyatt Place Hotel next door uh, from City Hall here, um, they took their crane down as well. If you hadn't had a chance to see how much that was blocked, uh, Jackson Street, I mean Florida Street, Florida Avenue between Jackson Street and Kennedy Boulevard. Um, that closed the road for about five days and they had to get a taller crane to take their other crane down. And um, that, w that went smoothly and, and thanks to COVID, it was very uh, low traffic and low impact. I'm sure there was a handful of people that didn't like it, but we can't please everybody. Um, they are planning to be open by Super Bowl, probably on a very similar schedule. Maybe not every room is 100%, but they'll be uh, open and have their uh, CO completed. Next slide, please. Um, the Henry Tower, which is the former Tyler Residences, they finally gave it a name. Um, development Ventures has uh, progressed significantly on the vertical structure of those floors. I think they're almost topped out as of this last week. Um, they're projecting to have about 188 park, uh, apartments for 537 residents. Uh, of course, they have about seven floors of parking and they'll have state-of-the-art state security systems. Um, they'll have gathering spaces on each floor, and the, their amenity deck will have a pool overlooking the campus. So this is well-suited to look towards University of Tampa, which they believe will be their main folks for, um, you know, the residents that they expect to be their constituents. Um, the development is projected to open in the fall of 2021, so they are a good you know, 11 to 14 months out from being complete and uh, beginning to rent. Um, Mr. Goods, uh, to respond to your request for an update on Kid Mason uh, Re Recreation Center, uh, I actually received an uh, email this morning about it, but they are about um, at 30% and they're going over the concepts with the architects. So they're scheduling that um, this coming week, as I understand. Uh, Chris Thompson from the Parks Department is the point of contact on that. And um, if you have any questions on that, um, I got next slide, please. You... Yeah, so the next slide is Madeira, Tampa. And you can see I'm, I'm taking a picture from the Poe Garage here. And I'm looking back to where the former uh, annex used to be. And now you can see the construction of two buildings in this photo. You're seeing in the foreground with the cranes on it is Madeira Tampa. It's right next to the Times building. And the, uh, the Henry is often to the right on the other side of the, ho of the uh, library. So as you can see, the, the work is progressing. Um, next slide, please. The Hyatt Hotel, this is what's across the street. You can see this with, this was taken right before the crane was being disassembled. Uh, they're starting to use this um, tower crane, which is attached to the side of the building. That's what they were replacing. And this is on track and it's starting to look very good. They are doing some of the rooms currently to verify that finishes are working out the way they're expecting. And um, since this photo, almost all of the upper floors of, of uh, exterior has been completed. They'll be coming and working their way back down and working out of the lobby. Most of the time these guys are moving to do top down when it comes to room finishes because the expense and the time and also having access to uh, the extra elevators. Next slide, please. So the ALV uh, roadway project phase two, um, you can see in this photo that uh, they've already demolished the whole intersection here. And the this photo is showing grading of this uh, in the, and the equipment out there for putting in the uh, large storm sewer that goes here. Most of downtown uh, it drains to this outlet that goes out to the river here. And there's a 72 inch pipe here that's been there since 1946. And we had to tap into that and put a large structure in that to connect the, the rest of the uh, storm sewer to the area. That took a, a fair amount of time. That was part of the two week delay. With that, um, this picture is not showing it very well, but the uh, asphalt has been laid for their base. The, the soils in this area were, were lower than it, than average, so we went with an asphalt base instead of a stone base. That was one of the items that was in the list that was approved last time. Uh, the longevity of these roads will be probably some of the best in the city because of the, the location and the access to get to these won't be that easy. And we obviously want to minimize disruption to our partners at the, the Stras and, uh, and the 
library and, and the neighbors that are moving into the area. Next slide, please. Before we move on to uh, channel districts, are there any questions for downtown? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Jingle, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rob. And I don't know if I had a chance to congratulate you uh, on your promotion. Thank but, you. Uh, I guess I guess we will we will see you with another hat on those capacities. Um, my question is, Rob, as related to the convention center, is um, uh, obviously these proposed renovations and plans have been in the works for a long time, but now we have COVID, and you know all the big facilities and institutions are going to have to make modifications, et cetera, um, especially some places like the convention center, to to encourage and accommodate um, future future guests. So I can't help but think that there must be a big project in the works or in the plans uh, along those lines for COVID renovations, um, especially also as related to the uh, any changes to the HVAC system. Um, I think you, meant, you mentioned the chiller system, but I would think that the filters you know, might have to be addressed uh, as well. So what do you know about what do you know about that? And uh, are there any price tags associated with that? Will they be coming back to the CRA for additional money in the near future, et cetera? Uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, the discussion for the uh, convention center does have a contract right now for GBAC, which is for uh, providing the uh, necessary changes for COVID related stuff in the near term. Obviously things that we've been planning for a while will have some adjustments in those as we revise the design to accommodate. Obviously we're, we'll be using different kinds of fabrics, things that are COVID friendly or, or you know, cleaning friendly so that they, we can address those. Um, but there is a, a separate contract that is being done right now that will uh, be looking to uh, be accommodated through the CARES Act. Um, some of that was required through, you know, a study and, and those pieces. And again, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, so I, I can't give you a better report than that at the moment. But uh, we did approve uh, a little bit of money to go ahead and uh, get the consultants to tell us what we need to do to get those things done. And, and I, I can leave that to Una Garvey to report in a more specific one as she's leading the effort on, um, you know, making those accommodations at the convention center. But I, I do recall that we, we did have a consultant that was going through that process to tell us what we need to do. Also, the certification to uh, is part of that process is um, to, uh, you know, let our folks know that uh, our customers there, uh, conventioneers, um, know that, hey, we are safe to come, and that's why we're going through this effort, and it's it's for the business of the, of the convention center. So... Beyond that, I, I would leave that to Una Garvey to give a more specific uh, report on that at a different time. Um, as for the renovations, um, you know, there were things that were still need to be done before we uh, stopped the work with the previous contractor and starting with this one. And that's part of what we're uh, going through to uh, articulate those changes and uh, how those will be accommodated. We are uh, incorporating more sustainability and resiliency uh, efforts in it, you know, idea of putting solar on top of the convention center is a big talk. Uh, how that will be accommodated, what will it look like? Um, there's different forms of doing that. Obviously, we're looking at um, doing a lead certification for the uh, convention center as well, and that is a, a piece that's being led by our new SRO, uh, Whit Reamer, and uh, that process is underway as we speak. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes, and, and maybe with your other hat on, you might want to suggest to Carol Post and to Una uh, Garvey that um, that they initiate some kind of report to council, um, you know, in the near future, um, you know, about those issues, because obviously those are going to be, you know, big ticket items and long-term long -term discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, sir. Big Any other questions before we start on to channel district? If 
Hassan. I'll go ahead and get started on Channel District. So the Channel District Projects team is continuing to engage property owners. We're, we're wrapping up a, a number of the last ones. Uh, with COVID, we've had to not be able to meet in person, so finding people's schedule and being able to share plans uh, on virtual has been helpful, but obviously uh, it's a little harder to read people's reactions when they're not in the room with you. But um, we've had very positive responses through the, the uh, engagement we've had, and most people are happy to see it. Uh, the, the majority of it is how long will it take and when will you know my driveway or my front of my business might be affected while we do those renovations. So with that, um, I'll move on to our, our list here and given a status as of the end of Janu uh, July. Uh, on the design, we're about 73% complete overall. Uh, we've been wrapping up um, some of the larger ones that are being done. Um, construction's just underway. Um, I do have an update on the uh, one of the pieces for 11th Street. It's a uh, much further, the, the irrigation and landscaping has been complete. I haven't been out to inspect this week yet, but uh, that work has been pushed a lot further in the past two weeks before, while I was, before I was writing this report. So um, we also are working very diligently for Cumberland and, um, I'm sorry, um, Twigs and 12th Street. We have two developments up there, one with ECI, which is Channel Club 2, and the other is the Daniel Corporation and uh, that is requiring us to do a contract with um, with Tico to move some of the overhead lines to make these parcels uh, buildable and as well as to get them out of the uh, way for other developments. So we're incorporating those relocations into those two projects, um, but we will be coming back to you in the next month or so uh, with a contract with Tico to do about $650,000 of that project cost for doing the TECO relocation. We just received the uh, uh, documentation from TECO and, and Morris has that and we're, we're reviewing that to prepare it for a later date. Um, beyond that, we're just continuing with construction. Um, Channel Side Drive project is uh, moving forward. They are doing their MOT permits right now and doing their ordering of uh, structures and pipes and doing uh, verification of underground utilities where they're about to dig. And uh, we should start seeing uh, construction um, later this month or mid-September uh, in a more real sense. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, take go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, at last month, since we you spoke, we the strategic action plan and community plan update um, we sent a, a draft scope to contracts admin based on their your input and the CAC input. Um, we did have a special call CAC meeting the prior week. Uh, we sent that to contracts admin. We put that out for the uh, pick three process that we've talked about, and we're getting responses over the next two weeks. Uh, we received, uh, I guess, between 10 and 12 responses of the, the 30 that were eligible. And um, we'll continue to watch for those as contracts admin, you know, gets those in. Uh, indirect activities, Channel Club 2, um, we were negotiating the development agreement for the relocation. Part of that was the uh, bonus provision agreement, which is being taken care of by Kate Wells from um, the legal department. But they're also a party to moving these polls as well. So that is part of that agreement. Um, the Daniel Corporation, which I mentioned earlier, is at 12th and Twigs in the northeast corner, which is for, for, known as the former DeMarcy parcel. Um, they're moving forward. They'd like to start construction um, in mid to late September. Uh, they're still in for foundation permits right now. And so the timing of getting the TECO work done is, uh, you know, obviously it needs to be coordinated with them. And so we've been talking with them uh, multiple times each week to get these things resolved. Um, next slide, please. Okay, before I move on to Tampa Heights, does anybody have any other questions for Channel District? If none, I'll go ahead and move on with Tampa Heights Riverfront. We have no direct uh, activity since the last time we spoke, since it hasn't been that long. Um, the CDD has submitted their first annual payment, which we paid. I mentioned that at the last time we met. Um, 
the first of two roundabouts is under construction and I think I have a photo for you in a little bit from that. Um, and it was taken three weeks ago. Um, the Heights Market is working with their food vendors uh, to remain open and attracting businesses for COVID during this COVID-19 restriction. Uh, I haven't heard too many complaints and I do see cars over there. So uh, again, I haven't eaten there in a couple of weeks because I'm back and forth as well. So Capital is finalizing their Tico transformers and switch gears that are gonna go on the south side of, of Henderson and, and near Burdick Park. So that's being wrapped up in the, in the uh, real estate departments take care of that. The Soho Capital is also coordinating with utility companies such as Verizon Frontier for other locations and we've been working with them to get those permits done. Part of that is also um, Verizon is dropping a lot of poles as well as a number of the other cell providers and they are getting their permits in a different way and I'm sure this is a whole other topic I'm sure you've heard of, but they are affecting some of our projects. So while we're in construction, someone shows up and drops a pole in the middle and they get the permit. So we're trying to, you know, work on that. And Carol led an effort to uh, uh, do a town hall meeting with the with all the vendors to give them some help and guidance of how to make that go more smoothly. Uh, the Heights Union building is uh, moving very smoothly. Uh, they're working to complete the cladding. Um, it's going very cleanly. It's going to be a very attractive building. Next slide, please. So this is a photo of the, the roundabout being constructed. This is about three weeks ago. I believe the pavers and everything are done and the, the center island has been graded out. The, uh, they're working on ADA ramps and, and getting this open. Uh, part of the reason this has taken as long as it had is because there were, because this whole area was known as Waterworks Park. We have lots of artesian wells in the area and a lot of shallow pipes that we used to connect these. And as we run into them, we, we have to address those. So we've been working with our water department about when those things come up about best practice to uh, resolve those issues. So some of those things have delayed construction, but that's what happens when you run, you know, work in a, in a very historic area that has lots of uh, water pipes in the area. Next slide, please. Any questions about Tampa Heights before we move on? Okay. I'll move on to Central Park. Uh, the Meacham Urban Farm progress has been going well. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just received some photos this morning uh, uh, showing me where they are on the construction of the portions that we help fund, as well as the uh, um, the uh, greenhouses that they're putting up. So uh, those are moving along very smoothly, um, and they're moving along. Uh, Encore Tampa is negotiating with uh, Lot 10 right now and uh, you'll see some photos about the Encore and Independent which are two co two projects by two different direct uh, uh, developers but they're using the same contractor to build both. There's apparently an efficiency there and uh, you'll see some photos here in a moment about that. But Transwestern is about 30 percent done with the parking portion of their garage and that was about three weeks ago and since then I think they're about 80 percent done because it's a precast garage. Um, the legacy um, partners have broken ground on the foundations for a 224 residential unit on lot 11. Next slide, please. So this is a photo of the independent taken from Cass uh, Street. And uh, you can see this is their precast garage and they'll be uh, building the rest of their development to tie to this um, in the very near future. So it's precast garage, that's where they're at. Uh, Having no more slides, I'll conclude my presentation. Can I take any questions? Thank you, Mr. Rosner. Happy to do it. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. This is our last slide for our monthly report. This is Michelle Van Loan again. Um, before I go into mine, I want to turn it over very quickly to Morris Massey. Uh, to update you on the Herman Massey Park. Uh, good morning, uh, CRA Board, uh, Morris Massey. Um, wanted to let you give you all an update regarding Herman Massey Park quickly. As you will recall in June, uh, you all uh, agreed to uh, move forward with a, a looking at the redevelopment of the plans for the Herman Massey Park improvements based on uh, the commitment of the owner of the adjoining building uh, to contribute about $42,000 to that effort. 
and we're, I was directed to uh, uh, draft an agreement to accomplish that. I have drafted that agreement. It, it was finalized in early July. I've sent it to uh, the adjoining property owner and her representative, Mr. DeMaio, for review. I have been in touch with them. They are reviewing the agreement now. Uh, they did have, there was some, uh, they've had some personal issues, personal health issues, and some other things come up, which has delayed their review of the agreement, but they have promised me their comments here so that we hopefully can bring that agreement back to the CRA board in September for approval. And so that's the status of the Herman Massey Park situation. Um, if there aren't any questions there, the other thing I'd like to briefly mention to you all, I sent to you all by a memorandum yesterday, a draft uh, proposed policy for a community benefits agreement um, on, in connection with certain CRA uh, major projects where we are providing financial incentives of benefits to private developers. And a community benefits agreement is an agreement uh, not with the CRA directly, but it's an agreement uh, between the private developer and a community organization in order to address the impacts of that development on the, uh, the adjacent community and to hopefully arrive at uh, some uh, incentives or some benefits that would uh, directly benefit the residents or the businesses nearby. Um, I don't want you all to adopt or do anything with this. I, I submit it to you all for review. Um, some of the uh, terms that I came up with, I've done in, in, in connection with uh, uh, discussions with Ms. Van Loan and Mr. Rosner, but um, we're, I think obviously this is something that, uh, you know, I expect the CRA board may want to look at some of the terms and, and we could have a further discussion. I would recommend maybe we put it on the September agenda to review in more detail and perhaps refine it after that based on your comment. So. Um, and, or October, because September we're going to have to talk about the budget. Okay. Budget. Okay, so that may be October. But, uh, but you all have a draft, and I'm happy to entertain individual questions, and, and then we can schedule it um, in the near future for, uh, you know, for final revisions and hopefully for adoption as a policy of the CRA board going forward. Thank um, you, Mr. Mesh, for your work. Sure, absolutely. Um, unless there are any other questions, I will... Uh, give this back to uh, Ms. Van Loan for her final uh, updates here. Thank you, Morris. Michelle Van Loan. Uh, so I just wanted to update you on our staffing updates. Uh, Jesus Nino is our new Dree Park and West Tampa CRA manager. I sent you all his background information. Today is officially his first day and I'll turn it over to him in a minute so that he may um, introduce himself to you and you'll get a chance to hear from him directly. Mike Callahan, who currently works in our planning and development department, uh, will be starting with us on August 31st. He's currently helping. Uh, he's going to spend a couple of weeks training and working with his replacement and uh, will continue to be in, uh, accessible by plan, uh, planning and land use development as needed. Uh, Mike is joining us to help with the transition from Rob, uh, from full-time CRA manager to part-time CRA manager as he takes on his new responsibilities and new role as director of economic opportunity. So Mike will be working directly with the four CRAs that uh, Rob currently oversees. Uh, Mike is very familiar with many of these projects, has been involved with a lot of the downtown Tampa Heights and Channel District projects. He's intimately involved with the planning of this and has been working with uh, Rob over the past several years on these projects. So we're glad that um, he has a very low learning curve in coming in to work on these projects and we're excited to have him as part of our team. Uh, as mentioned previously, my previous position of economic development specialist uh, had been multiple positions prior to the recession. During the recession, um, I took on multiple CRAs and we are going back to splitting that position. And so the economic development specialist that will be dedicated to Drew Park in West Tampa is currently in background check. And uh, as soon as that's completed, hopefully in the next few days, uh, the HR department um, will then have all the paperwork in, in hand and she will be officially announced and she will be starting by early September. And then the East Tampa economic development specialist program uh, specialist position again that would be dedicated full-time to East Tampa just like I was when I was first hired 
uh, we have an offer pending uh, with that position. And as soon as that gets finalized this week, they will go through all their background next week. And again, we expect that they will start by the end of August, early September. So by the time we come back to you September 10th, we should have our full complement of our staff. And I'm very excited to be able to introduce them to you. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Jesus Nino, our newest CRA manager, and let him introduce himself to you. Hello, it's Jesus Nino. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to keep this very short since your agenda is pretty packed there, but I'm excited. I'm excited to work here with the team, with the community, and all of you. And I'm going to do my best for the citizens of Tampa, West Tampa, and Drew Park, and just for the city in general. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome aboard. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. You're recognized, Mr. Thank you. You're recognized, sir. Um, yes, Jesus. Uh, um, if you get a, I don't think I got a chance to look at your resume, but if you could give us 30 seconds or, or, or thereabouts on where did you come from and what, what had you been doing? Well, I did my undergraduate in the University of South Florida there with Humanities and Cultural Studies and Urban Geography. And then I also did their Urban Studies program where I decided what I wanted to do was my career, which we took a field trip over to West Tampa and that was it. So I went up to um, Michigan State and that's where I got my master's degree in Urban and Regional Planning, Concentration and Economic Development and Urban Policy. Then my younger career was in long range planning and strategic planning and development review uh, then switched over to economic development then started doing cra stuff then got hired by the city of bradenton doing uh got hired by the city's bradenton central community redevelopment agency as their cra manager for a few years then the city of bradenton took me over took me over to them to their city hall and i became their economic development manager also their cra manager for their three cras so I have some experience, but as I learned over the years, every attorney has their own interpretation of things and you have to be respectful to that and Tampa has their ways and I'll do my best, you know, with my knowledge here and I'll learn a lot from the city as well. Hopefully Great, welcome answers. aboard, thanks. Welcome Thank aboard, you. thanks. Ms. Van Loon. Thank you, Chair. Yes, sir. Before we move on to item number three, I've received several emails from neighborhood uh, associations in the East Tampa area in reference to the roundabout. I guess some kind of misinterpreted or want more clarification when you talked about the art project and certain individuals that are going to be designing this and they're wondering where, when, when and where these means or did they miss these meanings uh, in reference to being involved in what they want to see in their community. And uh, again, I have Ms. Fran Tate. Uh, Ms. Frankie Jones, Ms. Regina, these are all the neighborhood association presidents. I guess they are listening to the broadcast, and I guess they have a little eyebrow concern that they haven't been notified versus someone just going to do some artwork and not get within reference to what the artwork is going to look like. So no, we're not that. An explanation? Yeah, we're not that far along with. I'm sorry if I was overly general. Again, I'm filling in for Ed on some of these details, yeah. and I've been out the past couple of weeks. Um, so our art people are working with us to research who are artists out there that um, can do artwork uh, in roundabouts, have experience and so forth, uh, as they did with West Tampa and some of the other communities. Uh, the process is that they will come to the West Tampa CAC and the partnership and talk about some of the, uh, they'll get input on what uh, they want across the three is there a theme is it three individual is it one artist no decisions whatsoever have been made yet this is all just discussion and planning as we move forward we knew we the the artwork is the very last piece and that we would have plenty of time to figure out the artwork uh as the project completes and all the landscaping and everything else so decisions on the artwork and the planning for the artwork will be a step they move into this fall. So I apologize if my um, vagueness in my comments led to any confusion. Well, that's okay. We we, uh, we have an explanation now. So those folks that are listening know that it will be included and in, uh, the project is ongoing. Uh, if you're finished with item number two, uh, Ms. Bello. Sure. I just left on the bottom of that slide for all of you. Just this is everything we have on the September agenda coming up. I'm sure there's a few extra items and we'll have our traditional approvals. 
Uh, and then as Morris mentioned, if it is all right uh, and pleases the chair, I would like to bring the benefits ordinance in October just so we can get through the budget process in September uh, for discussion in October. And with that, that would conclude our monthly report. With no objection to any other council members, we can move on. If uh, Mr. Ling could bring up the second PowerPoint on uh, item number three and go to the second slide. Thank you so much. Uh, luckily, this is very short compared to our discussion last month and the uh, amount of information we provided because now you've already got the background, uh, both from a legal standpoint as far as uh, amending our community redevelopment plans and so forth should any be changes be made. As I indicated with the, uh, the uh, partner motion to this one, we are only addressing the first half of the motion, which is uh, the potential to come up and develop a cap for the downtown CRA. The second part of the motion would have to be addressed between the administration and the city council during your budget. And I just wanna expound on that a little bit more than we did last month um, to make sure there's no confusion about how TIF funding comes to the CRA. The city council of Tampa established through the interlocal agreement and the current contribution for downtown is 95% of the increment. So over the base year, all property taxes that would have been generated previous to the base year do go to the general fund and 95% of the property tax taxes generated after the base year go to the CRA TIF account and 5% still goes to the general fund. I point this out so that when we talk about capping, it is not that the CRA agency is giving money back to the general fund. Uh, and the semantics here is important because of how you move forward legally. So should there be a cap, the interlocal agreement and following all of the process that Morris laid out last month, but the interlocal agreement would be adjusted to reflect no longer 95%, it would reflect that cap. What that means then is the property appraiser only sends to the CRA that new limited amount of TIF. So it is not as if that full 95% gets given to the CRA and then the CRA gives back to the city of Tampa. So anything that happens with those funds that go directly now from the property appraiser to the general fund are 100% under the purview of the city of Tampa, city council and administration as part of your general city of Tampa governance and budgeting process the CRA is no longer a party or has any kind of jurisdiction over those funds when it goes directly from the property appraiser to the city of Tampa general fund. The CRA only has jurisdiction on that portion that comes to the, the CRA. So I just wanted to make sure that distinction that whatever change you make to cap this, as a CRA agency, your jurisdiction is strictly over the money that comes into the CRA and any other discussions would be handled at city council and at discussions with the administration. So I just wanted to make sure there was no confusion about that. I also wanted to reiterate, um, just because of some comments that were made on the first half of this meeting about where the CRA money is invested. Uh, during our reports, we talk about direct and indirect activities and Rob Rosner's uh, report on Channel District is a good example. When you looked at that chart that Rob had up there and you look down those budgeted items that the CRA is investing in, you will notice it says street, 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 avenue, drainage ditches, uh, TECO lighting. The CRA dollars are going into infrastructure on public land and we are not contributing or giving money to developers or uh, commercial projects or anything of that like. And as we go into the next slide, again, I point that out, the types of investments that we are doing in downtown with the CRA dollars are in city infrastructure. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you, that's it, stay right there on the budget, thanks. So this again um, is a planning budget uh, it does reflect right now estimated, but it's been updated since we developed that this is the same budget I gave you and handed out last month in anticipation of this discussion. 
So we plan on starting FY21. I've highlighted it with that 16 million, or I'm sorry, the beginning fund balance of 18 million. I highlighted in yellow that 16 million. That is what the city uh, uh, property tax contribution is to the downtown CRA. And then you see county, there's a couple of counties. Those are basically passed through. So when you look at what the revenues are for the downtown, you can't look at that total 24 million because that 7 million you see from the two county contributions go directly back out per agreement. So when we talk about what the revenue is to the uh, downtown CRA, we're talking about that city portion, and then you see that port portion and uh, that little bit that will be ending uh, with the children's board that will expire. So the main portion of the revenue that we would be discussing when we talk about cap is what is currently reflected is that 16 million. The first part of expenses you see committed. These are the expenses that we have committed to either because we are in design of projects, we are under construction of projects, or there is a legal agreement. So the big legal agreement that everybody is aware of is our development agreement with SPP for the infrastructure, and it's referred to as the Master Infrastructure Agreement. This is an agreement by the county, the city, the CRA board, and SPP that the city or the CRA and the county will contribute up to 100 million. That's 50 million uh, shared equally between the county and the CRA to help with infrastructure in and around and public space in and around the SPP development. Uh, as many of you have seen and Rob has talked about over the past couple of years, we have a lot of streets where the grid is not in alignment. If you look at an aerial of downtown, you can see we almost look like a spoke wheel. We come in at angles, streets then straighten out. So a lot of the work that Rob has been doing is to better align these streets through traffic, uh, through connecting the downtown to the channel district and on that southeastern side of the downtown area. So these are the estimated years that the allocations would uh, be made based on when we would contract for the work. Again, as soon as that money is contracted, we have to set that money aside. It is encumbered, even though it may get spent over a couple of years based on the size of these projects. As you can see, a good chunk of this money, as we discussed earlier, is the convention center uh, remodeling and upgrades, their chiller, their HVAC, the new meeting rooms, uh, all of that work that has been in discussion for the past 18 months, they are currently in contract negotiation for that project, and it would be up to three years, Rob? Yeah, about three years. It would take about three years to implement that project. Then you see the potential. These are looking outward at projects that have been looked at or talked about in the Community Redevelopment Plan or have been talked about the CAC, uh, future street alignments that we would do um, after we handle the major ones we've committed to. All we have done is tried to place them in years to give you an idea about total expenditure amounts. Uh, again, none of these have to be within any of those specific years, especially potential. We're just trying to arrive at what uh, annual expenditures could be. Uh, off on the right in that box, these are additional projects that would go out beyond 2026. Um, again, we have not had for any of the potential projects uh, prioritization discussions at the CAC yet with these projects or with you as the CRA board, but we did want you to know here are all the potential projects and all the needed infrastructure still uh, for the downtown CRA. Uh, I highlighted in some colors, I just wanted to explain what the colors mean. So at the top, you can see the city revenue for FY22, 23, and 24 is in a peach color. Those revenue estimates, normally we estimate as city practice a 5% increase. Those three years, Rob actually went through and looked at buildings already under construction, projects already construction, estimating what the property taxes would be generated for the CRA. And so those revenues include 5% plus our, uh, Rob's analysis of what those new buildings coming online in those years would bring us additional revenue. And then as we get into 25 and 26, we start getting into guessing. And so we've gone back at the standard 5% for those two years. 
So these numbers could go up or down. Again, we're not aware of what COVID uh, may or may not have any long-term effect on our property values. At the bottom of the page, the two yellow highlighted balances, I just wanted to point out at your current revenues and current committed projects, we have very small uh, fund balances uh, due to all of these commitments. So any changes that you make to revenues, should you change FY21 or 22, uh, just be aware that we would then have to, especially in FY22, um, because it would take us time to make changes. You, any vote you take, as Morris uh, pointed out uh, last month, the process is to go and make recommendations to council. Council has to then make recommendations to the planning commission. We have to talk to the county and we have to go through that public hearing process. So we would not be able to implement a cap in FY21. The earliest year you would be able to implement is FY22. And so I just wanted to point out those low balances for those two years. Once we get into FY23 and some of these projects have been encumbered and start coming off our plate, you can start to see that the balances uh, start to grow again and there is some wiggle room. Next slide. So uh, just a couple of things. Uh, we talk a lot about, and there's a lot of uh, sort of characterizations about CRA revenue and what these investments are. And at its most basic, um, there's a lot of talk as if the CRAs are something that has been done to the city. So I, I just wanted to put this back in context. CRA revenue was a decision by the city of Tampa to target revenue within a district to an investment within this district. So the money is invested on behalf of the city into city infrastructure and programs. So this money that is generated, as Councilman Carlson pointed out, it's not invested in other areas, but it is invested in the infrastructure and into city projects within the CRA. Um, if you cap, um, we've talked about the process, but there are two different ways that you can cap the revenues for the CRA. Uh, as mentioned, it would have to be done through the interlocal agreement and go through the process and amending the community redevelopment plan. But you have two different options for how you could cap. We, as I mentioned, we are currently at 95% of increment above base year. You could reduce that 95% starting at a specific year uh, based on your discussion to a lower amount or to a step down amount. So if you wanted to go 90, uh, 85, 80 until you reached a certain year. Or you could say that looking at our projects, you feel that 20, 21, 22, 23 million, you could pick a hard dollar amount and state that any revenues above that dollar amount, that is what the CRA would get. Uh, there are pros and cons to both sides. If you do it at a percentage, you would immediately start reducing the revenues but at the same time, the CRA revenue can grow at, along with the percentage that goes to uh, the general fund. So if you keep it as a percentage, as the property values and increase, the actual dollar amount would increase for both the general fund and the CRA after that initial hit when you reduce the percentage. If you do a set dollar cap, should we ever run into issues with recessions, economic hard times, you can make sure that the revenues um, are always a minimum to handle the CRA projects. And if you set that minimum as a cap project, it also allows you to potentially have dollars for flexibility. Next slide. This is our last slide. Um, with your current budget challenges, as mentioned, we have several construction projects that are being bid out in the next 12 months. Um, until those projects are bid out, we won't know what those actual con uh, contract amounts will be and what those costs will be. Uh, we still don't know the impact of COVID. And aside from property values and our businesses, as we pointed out in that budget, the city or the county contributes to projects in downtown jointly with the CRA and some of those revenues come from the tourist development tax. And because of how hard hit our tourist development dollars are, we are unable at this time um, and the county 
is very concerned about what those revenues will be and when exactly they start coming back at levels that will actually allow them to contribute again to the Tampa Convention Center and the Tampa Convention Center upgrade and remodel. So that's a big unknown for us over the next six to 12 months for a project that we are now committing to moving forward with. And using the slowdown during COVID makes it the perfect time to start making those renovations as we uh, disrupt activity at the convention center minimally for any potential clients and get this done while we are in this unfortunate slow period uh, of activity in Tampa. So um, lastly, as I pointed out, your FY21 and 22 balances right now have very limited flexibility. If you do implement a cap, um, again, any money that goes back is no longer, um, will be going into the downtown has been discussed. We will have to fund uh, on a priority basis based on the development agreements, which are legal agreements we have with SPP and for the Tampa Convention Center contract. After that, we would have to start prioritizing which projects we would do with the balance of the funding. If you do provide a cap, uh, you would reduce your flexibility to respond to unforeseen situations. One example would be as we have a motion where we're coming back in September to talk about how can the CRA assist the cultural assets that are on city property and retrofitting and the expenses to retrofit uh, their facilities and their buildings in order to open back up safely to the public. And many of these are nonprofits uh, and uh, suddenly during a time of a slowdown for their attendees and other, uh, when other businesses are cutting back, their need now for capital to make these retrofits is very challenging for them. And so as the CRA board, you, these are your dollars to use for some of these situations if you so desire. And lastly, again, as you many of you know, the CRA agency, you have direct control over the CRA dollars. When you take that money and put it in the general fund, you are now dealing with the entire system of the city budget and partnering with the administration. So that's the framework and context. And with that, I'm going to quickly turn it over to Morris for any comments before you guys start your discussion. Thank you. Good morning. Um, just uh, briefly, I want to review some of the things we discussed um, at last month's CRA regarding the uh, potential term termination of the Channel District uh, CRA. And some of these, uh, some, what we discussed then are still applicable. We have an interlocal agreement with Hillsborough County. And, and in fact, we have another agreement with Hillsborough County that pertains specifically with the uh, Water Street project for SPP, as uh, Ms. Van Loan mentioned, um, where uh, I do not believe it obligates the city to fund um, the um, the downtown CRA at the maximum amount, the 95% uh, of the increment uh, that Ms. Van Loon went over, but it does reference that in several places in that agreement. So we would have to revisit that agreement with Hillsborough County. Obviously, uh, and the county and SPP's concern is that whatever action you would take to potentially cap um, how much uh, of the increment goes into the downtown CRA does not impact our legal obligations under our agreement with SPP, um, the way that agreement's written is that we are that both the county and the city put in 50% out of the CRA and the city put in a uh, CRA and the county, excuse me, put in 50% on a equal footing uh, at, at all times. So that no one's really out of balance. Um, so that's one aspect that we'd have to uh, to look at that I don't think is insurmountable. We also would have to review the two downtown CRA plans to make sure that there's nothing that doesn't have to be amended there. The other item that I did not mention in the channel district um, discussion that we would have to do, um, we establish, you establish the TIF for the downtown CRA by ordinance. And that ordinance, uh, when it was adopted, in fact, there are two ordinances for downtown since there were two CRAs created for downtown, um, provided for uh, a maximum contribution from the city at 95% um, of the TIF. Um, so that ordinance would have to be amended um, as part of this process. Um, and then lastly, uh, obviously whatever action we take here regarding a potential cap, the city, the city and the CRA is legally obligated to continue to fund the trust fund 
annually at least the level required to fund all loans, advances, uh, indebtedness, or contractual obligations of the CRA. So um, that's the other item that we, we need to be cognizant of in uh, the CAP discussion. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Masters. Uh, Ms. Vellone, anything else? No, we're good. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman. Well, you're recognized, sir. Um, I wanted to thank staff and legal for the presentations, only Sarah. Um, and I had a, a few comments. Uh, the uh, And Mr. Carlson, um, I give you kudos for always thinking outside the box. And, and I, I apologize last month for not being particularly enthusiastic on the channel side for the reasons that I mentioned that I won't go into back into today. But on the flip side, over the last couple of months, and especially this month, um, I'm seeing the, the positives of your suggestion, um, Ms. Mr. Carlson, um, on, on this idea. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're still on board with, the, uh, with your original idea. Um, in terms of how we actually pull this off and, and whether or not we do a percentage or you know, or a dollar cap, uh, I think that, you know, we can wrestle with that. And obviously, it's not happening overnight. Um, but I wanted to remind council of an idea, and maybe, Mr. Carlson, this will go hand in hand with your thoughts. And I know we're not, we don't have our city hat on, and I know that there's, you know, a lot of uh, procedural issues, and these are probably more city issues. But I wanted to throw it out because it's relevant. And that's um, a while back, uh, Chloe Coney and some others, in front of us before COVID, it was probably last summer or last fall, and we were talking about affordable housing. And Chloe and some others suggested what we really need in this community, like they've done in many other communities, is to create a permanent affordable housing trust fund. And, and I'd like to make a, a proposition, not a motion or anything, but just toss it out for discussion. And it's probably, like I say, it's probably also a city council discussion um, that if and when we do generate this excess money out of the out of the downtown, that we work with the administration to take that money and instead of just flopping it in the general fund, but consider putting it into an affordable housing trust fund, and that we could grow that trust fund year after year. You know, a couple million dollars a year will grow very quickly. We could we could hook up with the uh, with the banking community and the philanthropy community to say, look, we've got this trust fund. It's for specifically for affordable housing. Why don't you consider donating? Um, we could really build that affordable housing trust fund into something that we could all be proud of. So um, I just wanted to toss that out. And the other suggestion on a procedural side. And I've run this by Mr. Massey a little bit. Is maybe we could do this on an annual basis. Um, maybe Mr. Massey said it might need to be done by ordinance, but maybe every year the CRA by ordinance adjusts how much money um, you know th that is available from the downtown for the subsequent year. It's just part of the budget process. So that way. If those monies rise or fall, or, or the needs rise or fall downtown, we could have some flexibility uh, on a year-to-year -year basis instead of just saying permanently it's going to be 20 million or permanently it's going to be 80 percent or whatever. And Mr. I think Dinkler, that, let uh, me. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, you know, we did have a, some conversations about this, but the whole idea behind coming up with a percentage or amount that would be funded into the TIF is so that there can be some certainty for planning purposes so that you can budget, so the CRA can budget out over time how it, that, to make sure it can meet its various obligations and what it can do and ha what it can plan for um, with the CRA dollars. So I'm not, I don't think this is something we could vary every year. It is done by ordinance. Uh, that's how this is done. It's required by statute to be done. 
by ordinance, which is which means it's supposed to be done on a more permanent basis. That does not mean that if you do do decide to go forward with a cap, it's either a percentage or dollar figure, and 10 years down the road or five years down the road, something happens and both the city council and the CRA board, or actually it's city council that, that, that would have to adopt the ordinance, but that there's a decision to adjust the cap for some reason. You couldn't do that. Yes, I think you could do that, but it's not something that you would typically do every year as part of the budget process because it really just doesn't work, I think, from a planning process, process for purposes of the CRA. So. All right. Well, I appreciate your input. I'm not sure that's, that's the legal conclusion but maybe that's just a, a policy nudge but anyway um but like i say those are kind of the details we could work on um you know down the road but i i would i would like to see the cra have some flexibility uh to address you know potential contingencies uh down the road but like you say mr massey if it's an ordinance just like any other ordinance um it could be modified and amended if the need arises but the biggest point I wanted to make, Mr. Chairman, is um, uh, to Mr. Carlson, is that is that uh, I'm tentatively supportive of his idea of of some type of cap, and um, and that and then a second idea, which is um, perhaps as a city, uh, we could direct that money into a, an affordable housing trust fund uh, as opposed to just the general fund. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. You, you, you uh, recognize this, Miranda. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'm so happy that Mr. Dinkfelder brought that up because I was just reading a memo dated August 10th, 2020 from Carol Post uh, regarding items that are coming up in council members. And But since he brought this up, I think it is related to uh, CRAs. And let me read the one little sent a paragraph here. Raising private funds to support housing programs started in November 21st, 2019, when we asked the legal department to research and provide a staff report to council regarding city's ability to use nonprofit organization to raise money, to secure a pool of money to support and provide affordable housing assistance uh, or programs. It was originally started by my, uh, moved by myself and Mr. Citro, November 21, 2019, original motion to reschedule said agenda to March 19, 2020 initiated by Miranda, Mr. Miniscalco on February 13, 2020. Staff memo provided 311 of 20 requesting a 60 day continuance and due to many other things that certainly the, the COVID-19, it has to do with the delay in these things, but I'll bring it up later on, but I'm glad he brought it up because I was just reading my mail coming in today as I'm listening to the conversation at the same time as why and where we're at, but I'll, I'll, I'll speak to it later on, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? You want me to go next, or Carlson? I recognize, sir. Um, we went through the arguments of this last time. Um, I think the big difference here is that, at least to my knowledge, there's no opposition to it. Um, I've had several conversations with the SBP people, and as have staff, and um, their uh, staff have been talking to them, and their um, their needs are covered in the future by the way the needs of the other cra we talked about last time are covered in the future too and we'll hear more about that in six months but um uh to my knowledge there's no opposition to it they it, it's not like this money goes away the difference as as miss van Lone said is that uh it goes into the city so it it technically by charter city council controls it um so with a, our other hat on we could direct it however as you know in practice uh, the mayor administration helped direct it. So I think it's a, a, a negotiation with the mayor's office. Um, but I think the mayor's, at least this mayor's goals are aligned with where we want to go. Another argument against doing it is, well, you'll quote unquote, lose the county money, but the county has a limited agreement on this one anyway. And it's very um, specifically targeted and we can um, sign it. That's through an interlocal agreement. We can sign another interlocal agreement and get the county to put money in. And so if we need money for something like <clears throat> the convention center or whatever, we can do that. Um, I think, um, uh, Ms. Van Loan, you put, it, did you put money in there it, in anticipating that we might uh, include some budget for the arts in our next meeting? Did you, did you already include that as one of the scenarios? 
No, we're reporting back next month, and uh, so this has not been updated because the budget is uh, the draft budget again was the major construction projects that we had online, and uh, we haven't completed re that review yet to report back in September as to what the availability and where we could have that money come from. Yeah, all this all this really does. We're not getting rid of money. We're not giving up money. Um, uh, the money will. We'll just shift to a different box, and all we're doing is creating more flexibility for how to spend the money. Uh, we're not required to spend it in a certain area. We can, and then, um, as I said last time, it's not a. The CRAs are kind of a VIP pass to funding, and there are some areas of the city that that need it. Um, but in in the case of this one and Channel District, um, uh, they they've succeeded in their goals, and there's lots of money coming out, and we desperately need money in our general fund. This is discretionary money that we could use to fix issues throughout the city. Um, and, I, and if you look at the actual practice of it, and, and Ms. Goodley talked about it earlier, um, sometimes the, the CRA money is used to supplement things the city would have paid for anyway. And so um, uh, it, 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 what I think is we should, we should celebrate that, we, that it accomplished its goal. Um, if we need to put an additional budget in for, um, uh, for the arts groups, uh, for their, for capital improvement or whatever it is that we're allowed to do, I, I would be in favor of that um, because that, that's kind of the last piece that needs to be done. And um, um, if we could make a decision now based on um, Ms. Van Loan's suggestion, uh, we could maybe in, add an additional budget on it. If you all want to wait a month until after that presentation and vote on it, I'm okay with that. Um, as she said, for anybody who's still listening, we as CRA cannot, um, focus the money in other areas that my original motion was to try to push it um, into uh, East Tampa, um, Sulphur Springs and New Tampa. And by the way, I got a lot of flack from that in South Tampa because we have parks that are falling apart. I took a tour of a park next to McDill the other day that probably has a, ho a camp of a hundred homeless people in it with drug dealing and human trafficking and sex trafficking. And uh, it's one of the worst parks I've ever seen in my life. And it's, it's right in the core of South Tampa. So we, we desperately need money throughout the city um, uh, to solve problems. And, and um, what we can do is, uh, what, what this would do is it would just set a cap in the future. So after that point, um, if we need something in downtown, it would just go into the priority list along with everything else. So I'll listen to what everybody else says. And if you all, uh, if somebody else wants to make a motion, uh, let's do that. Otherwise, what I would do is maybe ask Ms. Fenlon out of all the options, what her suggestion would be, and then I can make a motion. Thank you. And, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, Vera. Oh, Miranda can go in myself. No, no, it was a okay, we'll get, we'll get Oh, we do, we do Chairman, I, I'll go. I have to log off from the call at uh, 12 p.m. today. I have a, a conflict. I just wanted to let you know on the record. Thank you, sir. Was that Mr. Miranda who uh, wanted to speak? Oh, it was Vera. Vera. Mr. Vera, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I thank everybody's um, contributions and thoughts, including uh, uh, everybody, Miranda Dingfelder, obviously, Councilman Carlson. You know, looking at this, I think some of the detriment, and I want city staff to please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which is some of the detriment that we looked at last month doesn't necessarily exist in this. That is, if, if I'm hearing things right and if I'm looking at things right, we're not going to be losing the funds uh, on the scale that we were to be uh, uh, looking at last month under uh, channel side. And again, I want to be corrected if I'm wrong in that regard, uh, if we're going to push this thing forward. Um, but number two is, you know, I think, uh, uh, I, I believe it was Councilman Dinfelder's idea on a house of trust is, is great um, if we can appropriate money into that, but it's, it's kind of like getting married. You need to have consent from the other person. And I want to make sure that there is buy-in from the administration on this. Um, again, we can push this forward, but I think the next basic thing, and maybe we have to do this when we wear our council hats, is to formally ask the administration about well, we'll buy-in because if the funds go to the general fund and then they're going to be spent on, you know, toilet paper or God knows what, we want it to go to the direction that we're looking at right now uh, for affordable housing in the aforementioned areas, including East Tampa, uh, 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 Sulphur Springs, uh, the USF, uh, North Tampa community, et cetera. I think that's important that we confirm that. Um, but uh, but I just wanted to confirm the, the first section because, you know, 
nothing's free. You're not going to get benefit without potentially giving up something. And I just want to find out what are we giving up? That That's it. What are we giving up? I think it's a, a, a good, sensible question to ask, but um, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may. You recognize the speaker. Yeah, just to put my two cents in. Um, general side, uh, excuse me, all of downtown is going to uh, experience a growth that this downtown has not seen in many, many years. And for that growth to happen, you're going to need the service industry personnel uh, to be able to uh, not only work downtown, but live downtown. We're looking, I'm looking for uh, workforce housing to come and channel side might be able to provide that however you have uh something that has to go hand in hand and that is talking about parking requirements to go along with workforce housing uh another area is channel side desperately needs community recreation parks uh and i'm wondering if these can still be uh used from the funds that are uh, collected from the CRA. So those are just two concerns of mine about the channel side CRA. Uh, I just had to voice that. I thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Chair, Anyone else? this is, yes. This is yes, if, if I just want to respond because it's not shown on here because we didn't show the FY21 budget, the FY21 budget for the downtown CRA has a reserve of five million dollars for an affordable housing project and early i believe it was like the january meeting of the downtown cac it was either december or january uh rob came to the cac and asked them if there was an opportunity to buy land for affordable housing were they amenable to that and they had also raised up to five million dollars to uh, look at that. And then you'll see a complimentary $2 million for affordable housing if in that budget I gave you in the PowerPoint for FY21 that uh, if there was needed, again, adjacent street work or any infrastructure work or anything that went along with an acquisition. And we are still hoping um, within a reasonable period of time that there will be that opportunity and ability to do a major, at least one major affordable housing project downtown. And then you will see, uh, we also tried to plan in the future for another large outlay uh, for an affordable housing downtown. Given the current state of development on the north side of downtown, especially the properties along the highway and along our major transportation routes, we do believe that there are opportunities to pursue some um, multifamily affordable housing projects in the downtown CRA. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Charlie. You're recognized, you're recognized as many. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, along with what Ms. Van Loan just said, I would imagine from what I interpreted is that there is funds that uh, are available from the, the CRA to create buying of land and possibly uh, giving some assistance to building the homes. And if there's $5 million, I don't know what the CRA is. That's up to them to decide what they're going to do with it before they present it to us. I don't want to be forceful in any way or any way. You say you have to spend it on this. That's what you have the CRA boards to do that, bring it up to us. And, and what I'm saying is if that's a cause, and I think that's one of the avenues that you can use to create, uh, you know, work style, affordable housing, whatever word comes to it, because it, it means so many things to so many people. And there's there's uh, the equity part, which I appreciate very much. That's how people build equity as they're going through life. And uh, you can sell it anytime you like, it's your house. And what I'm saying is that if that's a case, that's one avenue that all the CRAs, if one can do it, they can all do it. And uh, I know we gave, a, not I, but the CRAs volunteered and for one Tampa created uh, amounts of monies that we could have used for something else. But at that time, there was a necessity to keep the small businesses going. And, and that's a very honorable thing to do. Uh, so later on, again, I think I'm going to bring back up the item that came back in November of 19 and how we can do that, uh, how we can create that and possibly out of that one Tampa fund that they have. Uh, and, and that's a, a fund that you can put money to and you can 
you know, do things with like the mayor did in helping the small business association. She can have it off shoot, possibly off that same Tampa one Tampa. And these are the things that you do one by one regarding item three. I know that there's, and I forgot the name of it, but in Tallahassee, the CRAs are handled. And I don't know if it's a chief financial officer or the uh, state attorney's office uh, that runs under the, the, the state government. They can tell us what we can do and what we cannot do in the CRA. And before I make a judgment on one way or the other, I would like to have this board send through our legal department a request for them to look at the statement that uh, is on online now that Mr. Carlson said, and I'm not against the statement. I just want to have clarity that we have certainly the right to do that before I vote on something. And that's all I'm asking for. And that shouldn't take more than... 30 or 60 days, I would imagine. So I'm not trying to sideline anything. I just want to make sure that what we're doing is within the statutes of the state of Florida when they created the CRAs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Anyone Chairman, else? did I make Mr. a motion? Mr. Chairman, uh, Bill, 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 before you do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Diffie, you're, you're, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to follow up one other thing, um, and, and Mr. Sicho, um, I definitely agree with you that uh, people who work downtown should have the ability to to live uh, close by, um, and I and I, I commend you for suggesting that a while back, and and now it's you know part of the the CRA um, sort of loo you know loosely in the CRA plan, but I want to suggest that. If we if we move forward with Mr. Carlson's idea in some form, um, you know I've been a realtor now. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I've been a realtor for about seven years, but it doesn't take a realtor to to know that you can get a lot more for your money outside of downtown um, in terms in terms of property and the potential for building affordable housing. So so. Um, what I'm, you know, and I, and it doesn't, it's not really going to impact Mr. Carlson's motion, but I just wanted to throw this out in terms of the conversation. But Michelle, while we might have the five million dollar in that downtown budget, if Mr. Carlson's motion passes, it's possible we can take that five million dollars, you know, and and turn it into ten million dollars worth of land if we if we go a little bit north into Tampa Heights or a little bit east into East Tampa and 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 be able to buy a lot more land. Um, and do a lot more uh, for affordable housing slightly outside of downtown. So I want us to be flexible on that um, as we go down the road. And even though we put that in the budget, to know that under Mr. Carlson's plan, we might be able to shift it out of the budget and do a lot more affordable housing, you know, within a few miles of downtown. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Mr. Chair, um, I, I know you but, haven't made but, your comments but, yet. Could I just right. make a quick comment and then? Um, yes, I'll let uh, you make your comments and I want to comment. I have a three areas that I want to discuss about. CRA. Thank you. I know ahead, Mr. Maniscalco is leaving in three minutes. <laughs> so I was, um, it, with the motion that I would make would be to uh, propose that city staff come back with an ordinance um, either at the next CRA meeting where we'll be discussing the, the, um, the arch groups or the one following that, that would have given them plenty of time to look at the arts groups and also to do whatever analysis uh, Ms. Miranda mentioned, and then uh, and just come back to us with their best recommendation of an ordinance that we could put forward. And so we would ask them today just to uh, just to go forward with proposing an ordinance, and then we could vote on uh, up or down on the on the merits of that um, either in a month or two months. I'd second that, man. I don't. I discussion clarification for mr massey because i don't believe we can yes. make any ordinances doing a cre meeting that no. has to be done you're, 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 you're absolutely cor you're absolutely correct uh the ordinance would be a city council ordinance i think what we could come back if that if 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 the general consensus of the cra board is to move is to propose a cap on the downtown cra is for uh for you to direct staff and legal to come up with the the plan you know uh, what the what we would propose that cap to be or how that that would and discuss with you and then how and how to implement that and i think that would be uh, october would be the date to do that 
Um, but the implementation, actual impl the steps to implement it would require city council action on several fronts, including a possible amendment of the interlocal agreement with Hillsborough County and the adoption of the, an ordinance uh, capping the TIPs. And that would all have to be done by city council, not the CRA. You would make recommendations to the city council. Mr. Chair, if I may. Ms. Tiffin, we recognize. Yeah, and thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly, I, I thank uh, Councilman Dinkfelder for his input. Uh, however, uh, when I mentioned workforce housing in downtown, I also mentioned parking requirements. Uh, if people are going to be working downtown, and I understand that land is cheaper out north, but what, what you have to consider also is those people then have to have vehicles because all for transportation may be in limbo. And this county has not done the greatest job, especially with that DOT, in getting some sort of transportation for people to get to and from Eastern Hillsborough County, North Tampa. Uh, if, if we change our parking requirements to workforce housing downtown, then people wouldn't have to drive their car. They wouldn't have to have maintenance, insurance, upkeep, those sorts of things. So I, I'm, I'm actually still trying to get people that work, down, that live, work downtown to live downtown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else? Ms. Clark, before you make any motion, I'd like to make uh, a few points, if you might. Please go ahead. Sorry I, I to think, interrupt you earlier. <laughs> I, I think for me, there are three points. You know, CRAs are under siege in Tallahassee. And I want us to be cautious because several state representatives have contacted me in reference to we need to be cautious about what we're doing if we want to try to set a precedent somewhere because it could be detriment to other CRAs uh, that we have in our city. Those could be big issues. That's number one. Number two, when I look at we're talking about taking money away, I want to make sure that those debts are going to be cleared. And from what I'm hearing and what Ms. Long was explaining it to me, that we have to make sure all liens, all debts are paid, and we don't owe anybody. No one's not going to come up and sue us because we don't have the money to pay. We, we, we may be in a recession in a couple, uh, uh, another year or two. So I, I, I'm, I'm leery about that. And the biggest point is we all know that, you know, they use this word strong form of government. If you say we cap and we give a percentage to the general fund, what guarantees do we have that that's going to be utilized where we're saying we want it to be utilized? I, 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 that's what I, 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 I really tumble with understanding if we do make a cap and we're saying we want it to go somewhere, will that administration use it to go there? Uh, that those are the things I think we got to look at and be able to have discussions with and, 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 and see how that will work. So those are just a couple of points I have on it. i still looking for more information to make sure I'm clear on it, but I, I think that the biggest part Mr. Miranda said is maybe having someone uh, from the state or someone come and explain to us the real do's and don'ts so we, or our legal get with them to make a presentation to us what our do's and don'ts are before we run down a path that might be a wrong road we're going down. And that those, those are just my, my points. Mr. Chairman, may I speak? Yes, sir. Miranda. I, I appreciate those comments very much. I, uh, I'm all for doing things that will help individuals who really need the help to get affordable housing. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, and certainly I'm not a realtor. But yes, the cost of land downtown is maybe five times more, ten times more than outside the rim of downtown. But where can you build, if you built, Single family units, Single you're family fine. Unit. And but if you do a semi high rise, a seven, eight, ten floors high, then the land is divided by forty or fifty units, not not ten. So the, the cost is, and, and what everybody said is factual. If you live close to downtown, you can walk to work. If you look away from downtown and you work in downtown, you're going to have to either buy a car or wait in public transportation, which sometimes is great, sometimes is not so great. So these are the things that the individuals who need the most help are looking at. A, you got to have transportation. If you work close to downtown within a mile or half a mile, you walk like you do an exercise, you go to work and you come back and you don't have to spend, you know, $1,500, $2,000 a year in insurance plus the maintenance of the car, plus the purchase of the car, plus the tag of the car. You're looking at about four or $5,000 a year to own a car. And that's what it comes out to. So these things have to be taken into consideration. If you have the ability in downtown through even the CRA or the town down development authority to go out and, and have your little uh, cars and pick up people and bring them in, you don't even have to walk. 
If we had any type of rail, you wouldn't have to walk. But there's nothing wrong with walking. What I'm saying is that it needs to have the authority of those that have the authority to give us the right to do what Mr. Carlson said. I'm not against it, but for me to vote for something that I don't know if it's legal or not legal, it's putting the city and other CRAs and other areas, look what Tampa's doing. What's wrong with them? And that's what I don't want to start. I'm not against the motion. I'm just saying that I'd rather have Tallahassee Senate's Yes, you can do this. No, you cannot do this. Then we're looking at other avenues how to how to do it. The if the downtown authority, downtown CRA or other CRAs wants to build affordable housing, I see nothing wrong with that. That's what the CRAs are for. To help the blighted area create some type of development so it can fester itself and do much better within its own confine. And that's what life is all about, helping somebody else giving a hand up, not pushing somebody down. So these are the things that have to be done before I can vote yay. I don't want to vote nay, but I got to have the authority from those people. CRA is something that we have jurisdiction, but we don't create the laws on how it functions. That comes from the legislature. And you're right, Mr. Chairman, that those people have called you that are in the legislature cautioning us that they be careful, do the right thing. Let them go up there. It's not going to take many, many, many days. I would imagine within 60 days you have it, you have clarity. And then you're on the road on what you want to do. You want to do. But that's all I got to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If I can interrupt, this is Morris Massey. Let me, a couple, I'm happy to to talk to folks in Tallahassee to confirm uh, the procedure for capping the trust fund. There is a state statute about the redevelopment trust fund. It's section 163.387 Florida statutes. It does say that the governing body, which would be Tampa City Council, may in the ordinance providing for the funding of a trust fund established with respect to any community redevelopment area, determine the amount to be funded by each taxing authority annually um, shall, be, shall be less than 95%. But no one, uh, but in no event shall such amount be less than 50% of the, of, the, of the increment. That's what the statute says. But I'm happy to go back and talk with both the attorney for the Community Redevelopment um, uh, FRA. FRA, Florida Community Redevelopment uh, Authority, uh, uh, regarding how that would apply in this case and whether we have the authority to do that. If you want us to go further, we could go to the Florida Attorney General, uh, although I, I'd, like, I'd like to talk to the city attorney about that before we did that, and that's something that typically you don't we don't necessarily do unless we really are concerned about it i think where i think the the major issue of concern that i'm hearing is whether whether you cap if you do go forward with capping um the uh community redevelopment fund for uh the downtown cra whether that money can be directed somehow specifically in another way and the answer to that is it would go automatically into the general funds of the city and would be subject to the budget process. And that's where you'd have to deal with it. Now, this, that takes a CRA, you as a CRA out of that, and you can't determine that as a CRA board. You also are the city council for the city of Tampa with your city council hat on, you do approve the budget for the city of Tampa and you do have authority in that process to direct how funds are spent. So that would be how you'd have to deal with that issue. Um, so that, that's my legal advice of today. Again, I'm happy to, make inquiries regard with uh, the, the Council for the Florida uh, Community Development Authority in Tallahassee, though, and, and come back in September, October with further clarification before, before you take action, if that's Mr. how you'd like to appear. Mr. Mr. You're right, Chairman. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I know it goes without saying, but in having Morris Massey be our attorney here we have one of the one of the sharpest minds in in the city and perhaps the state and when it comes to these kind of issues and specifically you know, real estate matters not to mention there's grimes and the rest of the staff so i don't have i don't have any doubt that we're on good legal footing uh, or they wouldn't have let this conversation get this far um so um but, but, you know, we can always be careful, and Mr. Massey will contact the FRA attorneys and make sure that we're not stepping out of bounds. I think the concern, I, I would guess that the concern of these legislators or other folks in the community is that 
you know, perhaps if we're going to cap the downtown, then the next thing they're worried about is that we're going to cap, you know, East Tampa or we're going to cap West Tampa or, you know, some of these other things. But it's sort of apples and oranges because, you know, downtown and, and Channel Side are, are totally different from these other ones. Uh, you know, these are these are uh, these are areas. I'll just specifically mention, you know, downtown. Downtown's been around for I think what is it, Charlie? Like three decades uh, as a CRA. It's very successful. It looks like it does have some excess money, and the legislature couldn't possibly be mad at us for taking that excess money and putting it back to where it came from, which is the general fund to start with. So, um, so anyway, I I I think people probably are, maybe they're getting confused. Maybe they're mixing apples and oranges. But I you know. I, I think Mr. Carlson's suggestion is a sound one, and depending on what his motion sounds like, I, I think we need to need to temper the motion to what Mr. Massey said, which is just to, you know, move slowly, ask staff to come back in October, uh, you know, with with all the instruments and reports that we need, and uh, and progress from there. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'd like to make more, one last point before we take any motions. Uh, I guess. My biggest concern is if if you do a cap that goes back to the city council, from that point, taking money to go someplace else, we've got no guarantee. Yes, we control for a balanced budget for the city, but there's no guarantee when we ask to put that money, that money's going to be utilized to go where it needs to go. That's the concern I have to where we throw it in the general fund and whatever mayor decides to do their budget, and it's not allocated what we say. That's that's my biggest concern, taking money from somewhere, and we don't have any guarantee that we're going to be able to get the bang for our buck. Uh, would you agree, Mr. Master, or how would you characterize what we could do if it was a CR board, CH, uh, city council board to dictate into the money? Pardon me, Councilman Goods. I, 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 could you repeat the question? I apologize. I, I guess my biggest concern, if we take dollars to go to the general fund, we've got no guarantee where that money will go if we're if, as a city council we're saying directed to go here or go there correct i mean you you have a, the you you are part of the budget approval process you must approve the budget annual budget uh, by ordinance so you can make adjustments in the budget um and so that's where your level of control as city council would come um, obviously the, the budget is proposed by the mayor and so the the administration of the mayor would propose the budget to you all, you could ask, I think at city council, you could ask for a report of how much money, um, you know, resulted from capping the downtown CRA, how much of that money went into the general fund and how that, that, that amount of money is being spent in the budget or after that amount be spent in a, in a certain way and ask that they show that as part of the budget process that you could, you could ask that with your city council hat on. Now as the CRA, it's once you, have capped it, it's really outside of the CRA's control. Now, could that be done by ordinance on the city council, which you just described? I don't believe by ordinance, it, um, but you could you could ask it that they, they look at it. I mean, the budget process is, is controlled largely by charter and statute, um, but you could you could ask for the, you know, the, the administration report that and that you expect that to be done. Okay. okay. All right, sir, thank you, that's my question. Any other uh, discussion before Mr. Carlson puts his motion on the floor? Could I make a couple comments or? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think <clears throat> the, um, to the point about whether we have control or not, I think by charter, we, we were on the charter review commission together. I think we, <clears throat> uh, uh, if, if city council um, uh, is, um, uh, has some consensus about what it wants, I think it can negotiate. Remember last year, um, you made some bold moves regarding the budget, and and the, the mayor's office uh, worked with us. Um, we can't guarantee what would happen in the next administration, but um, in the in the next few years anyway, we could we could try to redirect this. Um, as to the other thing, I've heard the same concerns from um, some legislators and others. Um, I've also talked to the other side. Um, you know, I think everybody knows. I I, I think that CRAs are an imprecise um, tool. They mainly um, uh, focus on real estate and infrastructure and uh, the trap funds. Um, they were not allowed to use the money for services that are badly needed. 
in the in the neighborhoods where we need them. Um, and so it's a it's a way of keeping it. It also um, encourages uh, or 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 is paid or funded by real estate development, which in, which is really uh, connected to gentrification. But I'm not. I want to make it clear to anybody listening. I'm not going to propose changes to any of the other CRAs. I will fight vehemently any new proposed CRAs. But um, which is one of the reasons why I'm pushing this. I think instead of creating one in Uptown, for example, we could we could uh, try to redirect money up there. And it and it is awkward in the way we would do it, but it just it just takes us from one hat to another. Um, the concern about what's happening in Tallahassee, I think, is a, is a good reason to do this. I think the fear of touching any CRAs uh, as adding fuel to the fire for the people who want to get rid of CRAs is is the opposite of of what would happen um downtown cra and the channel district cra's are examples of the kinds of cra's that that many legislators legislators want to get rid of uh, why is it fair that in south tampa for example we've got um uh you know dr terrible drug dealing and human trafficking going on in a big park right next to the centcom when uh when and and up until recently we had rats in a community center um, when uh, when we get gold-plated amenities in other parts of the city. We should be able to make, if the money goes into the general fund, then we can make the decision. We can always still put it back in downtown and we can apply it to whatever we want in, in partnership with the city council, I mean, with the mayor's office. Uh, but if we don't do something, then these are the kinds of uh, CRAs that, uh, that let certain legislators will use as examples as to why they should shut down all of them. And I think it's prudent to put a cap on it. And Tampa could be seen as a leader. And um, if we position it right, we'll declare it a success story. We, uh, city of Tampa, pushed these forward. They succeeded. Look at all the developments happened in downtown. You saw the pictures last week that one of the developers showed. It's it's a great success. And let's celebrate and move on. Anyway, with the comments, um, I don't know what motion I can make now, Mr. Massey. Can I make a motion to um, to put this uh, to to have you all come back with a proposed ordinance? Um, in in two months or not? Can, do I have to do that in city council or can I? What motion can I make today? I think the appropriate motion to make, Councilman Carlson, is to ask that both uh, the me as your legal counsel and Miss Van Loan come forward to, with you in October with uh, a plan, both a timeline and the various steps that need to be taken to cap the downtown CRA. And propose to you a uh, a either percentage or dollar figure for that cap, uh, for you all to uh, affirmatively uh, recommend to city council, and then a lot of these actions, the formal actions about any changes to the interlocal agreement, or to the community redevelopment plan for downtown, or the ordinance um, relative to uh, the, the funding of the tips, would have to be actually adopted by city council. But the first step would be for the CRA board to, to, for us to present formally to the CRA board exactly what, what needs to be done, the sequence, the timing of it, have you all recommend that we move forward with that and then we'll, we'll start moving down that, that train and, and presenting those things and having those public hearings uh, before you as city council if that's your will. Okay, how's this, um, Mr. Chair, can I make a motion? Yes, sir. Um, so I'd l I move that uh, city, city and CRA staff come back to CRA board at the meeting in two months to present a specific recommendation for putting a cap on um, the downtown CRA um, and any proposed motions or ordinances that we would need to um, recommend to city that city council approve. Ding Calder, I'll second, second that. Ding, Ding, Ding Calder, second. Um, all right, all right. Motion, for, motion for Mr. Carson. Motion for Mr. Carson. Second, Mr. Dean Thank I'm you. And, motion, and, the, and the second, the um, a friendly suggestion on that, Mr. Carlson. So it's abundantly clear to to uh, some of these uh, significant stakeholders is that um, uh, the, there is no intent to impact the uh, existing contractor agreement as related to SPP, the county, uh, the convention center. Yeah, maybe just an addendum um, uh, to uh, 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 in line with the, the uh, first motion, 
which was to um, put a place a cap after all existing and anticipated obligations are met. Yeah, well, I, I think I want to be careful on the use of obligations because staff might have a different idea on what an obligation is. But, but I'm specifically concerned about you know the SPP and the convention center and the county obligations. I think some of those order, other order, quote, order, obligations. Order, order, order. Board of order, Mr. Carson, are you changing the verbiage of your original motion set forth? Well, I'm, I'm, I was just, I, I tried and then I'm now listening to Mr. Tinkle. I think the original motion was to, was to, after all of those um, obligations or anticipated obligations were met, then to recommend a, a, a cap on top of that. Um, if you all want to word it some other way, we can, but. Well, as long as, as long as it includes the fact that we're going to honor uh, existing contractual obligations, I'm good with it. My motion, my second will stand. Okay, thank you. Motion for Mr. Carlson. Second by Mr. Dingfelder. Discussion. Chairman, I, 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 I need the the, uh, the motion to be read again by Mr. Carlson. I apologize, but also let me just, they can call me pessimistic. They can call me whatever they want, but I'm going to say this again. And, uh, not in 2021, but in 2022 <clears throat> is when this city, this county, this state, and this country is going to really feel the pinch of COVID-19. When things are happening and they're not, that haven't done anything now because they've been holding back and holding back on these individuals that are going to possibly lose their homes and businesses that are going out of business because the business is just not there anymore for one reason or another. And that was happened in 2022 when the tax assessor does his trim notices now that we'll get them in October for the November start, it's not gonna reflect much difference. But when they do this trim notice, when we're in 2021 going into 22, hold on to your wallet, because I think something's gonna happen. And this is gonna have an abundance of effect, not only in this CRA, but in every CRA we have. And on all the, I hope I'm wrong, but from what I've been reading and what I've been studying from economists, not from me, it's saying that in 2022 is when the wave of downfall is going to happen. Already we've had the last quarter 30 some percent loss, the highest since the Great Depression. And all I'm saying is the facts. These are not my facts. These are what I've seen and what I've read. So I may be a pessimist, but I call myself a realist. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, if I may, this is Vera. You recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. You know, the way I see this motion, it pushes it forward for further consideration for an idea that obviously I think it's seven to zero agree has a lot of merit. Um, There's certain things that need to be fleshed out uh, from, from legal, uh, obviously from administration buying as indicated. I, I think this pushes it forward um, and that's fine um, and whatnot. I also wanted to echo Councilman Miranda's pessimism. I don't think it's pessimism. I think it's it's reality just for, for whatever it counts. Um, you know, you, you take a look at our, our city budgets. A lot of us, have, a lot of cities have been bailed out by CARES Act funding, uh, which comes about due to, you know, three, four trillion dollar annual deficits now that we have. Fast forward a year or two, whoever is uh, the next president, if it continues to be our present president or, or, the, or former vice president, there's going to be some really ugly scenarios that are gonna have a massive negative trickle down effect in our local governments. Um, so I don't think that's um, uh, unnecessary pessimism uh, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, but uh, just my thoughts on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. The maker of the motion will please restate the motion, please. Sure, I, I move that the CRA board ask city and CRA staff to return to the CRA board meeting in two months to report their best recommendation on capping the downtown CRA district, assuming that all current anticipated obligations are met and that staff propose any actions or ordinances that the CRA board would need to recommend to city council. Baker has made his motion. I believe Mr. Dingfeld second the motion. Is that concurrent with your, uh, with your amendments, Mr. Dingfeld? Yes, the second stands. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, you're, rec you're recognized, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Mr. Massey, 
um, uh, you, you and I are not only colleagues, but we're friends, and I do trust in your legal opinion. I hope this is going to also include what uh, Councilman Miranda brought forward about the uh, legal ramifications with the state of Florida. Will that also be included in your report, Mr. Massey? I promise on October I will have discussed this with the uh, General Counsel for the Florida Community Redevelopment Association and will uh, let you know what his thoughts are on our legal ability to cap uh, uh, pass an ordinance or City Council passing an ordinance capping uh, the uh, city's contribution to the uh, uh, to the downtown tip. Mr. Massey, I thank you very much. Uh, the City of Tampa CRA uh, board is, in my opinion, one of the best in the state after uh, going to such places as League of Cities for Florida. Uh, just because other cities and other CRAs within the state had some, um, shall we just say, some wrongdoings within their CRAs, we are a shining example of CRA associations. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Massey. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion before the vote? Any other discussion before the vote? Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Yes. Goods? Yes. Dean Felder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Citro? Yes. Citro? No. Miranda? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We'll move to required approvals. Item number four. Yes, sir. Michelle Van Loan. This is a resolution approving a lien subordination for a facade grant applicant who received a grant two years ago. He is now requesting to take out a second uh, small loan on the property and it would move us into the third position as far as liens behind the first two mortgagers. And our only risk is should the company go into foreclosure, then obviously we'd be in the third position behind the banks. Of the 110 plus uh, facade grants that we've issued, we've only ever had one go into foreclosure and that was during the recession. So we're asking approval of this uh, subordination agreement. Move the agreement, Ding Phillips. Ding Phillips. Second, Vieira. Second by Mr. Vieira, in discussion, in discussion. Roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Sierra? Yes. Goods? Yes. Ding Felder? Yes. Maniscalco? Maniscalco? Carlson? Yes. Citro? Yes. And Miranda? Miranda? Motion carry with Maniscalco being absent at vote and Miranda being absent at vote as well. Oh, yes. Well. <laughs> okay, restated. Restate the move. Restate the motion carry with Manny Scalco being absent at vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Item number five. Item number five is the reprogramming of the funding for the annual payment according to the Tampa Heights Redevelopment Agreement. I have a request from Ms. Van Loan to have a motion to approve. Second, Vera. I didn't hear the, mo I didn't hear the motion carried. So move. Miranda. Motion to approve by Mr. Uh, Vieira, second by Mr. Miranda. Discussion. Discussion. And quick roll call. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dink Felder? Yes. Maniscalco? Carlson? Yes. Pedro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Motion carry with Maniscalco being asked in a vote. Thank you. Item number six. Item number six is the reprogramming within the Central Park Community Redevelopment Agency. This is for the Meacham Farms Urban Farm, our contribution towards their educational building that Rob did a presentation on earlier this year. Thank you. So moved. Second, Second. Vera. 
approved by Mr. Sutra, second by uh, Ms. Moran, I believe, in a discussion. In a discussion. Roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Sierra? Yes. Gooch? Yes. Dinkfelder? Yes. Dinkfelder? Yes. Lenny Skakel? Carlson? Yes. Citro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carried with Lenny Skakel being absent at vote. Thank you. Item number seven. Our last item this morning is the slate of candidates for the East Tampa Community Advisory Committee. As a reminder, in East Tampa, the general partnership of the ETCRP votes its CAC members. We have six openings, and since I started doing this in 07, this is the largest slate of candidates at 17 we've ever had. We're asking that you approve these slate of candidates that then would be voted to the CAC at the East Tampa meeting in September. A motion to approve? So move. Second. Miranda. Motion moved by, motion moved by Mr. Miranda, second by Mr. Citro. Discussion. Mr. Discussion. Chair, if I may. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, you recognize. I, I'll, thank you, Mr. Chair, very much. Along with Ms. Van Loan, I am also happy to see that these many people have applied to uh, become part of the CRA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion before the vote? Question on Any further discussion? Question on motion. Mr. Uh, Dingfeller, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle, it, it, as, as Mr. Citro indicated, uh, it is very exciting to have that kind of community involvement uh, in the CRA. Um, uh, do they have opportunities for folks who don't actually make it onto the board to be on some other, you know, uh, subcommittees or anything like that uh, so we don't turn good people away? Yes, sir. We have both the partnership that people can attend and we have, I believe we have uh, six to seven, I haven't counted recently, subcommittees from everything from housing to land use to aesthetics and beautification uh, in the East Tampa uh, CAC. So people are welcome to attend CAC meetings. They're welcome to participate on the subcommittees and also to participate in the East Tampa Community Redevelopment Partnership. Okay. So they, they can be members of the subcommittee without being members of the CAC? Oh, yes, sir. Our CAC would never be able to handle that many subcommittees within its own membership. Okay, excellent. Yeah, let's, let's make sure they don't get turned away and discouraged. Thank you. Mr. Chair, could I say something? You're, you're, you're recognized, sir. Ms. Van Loan, just for the record, for anybody who's watching, can you just explain what happens uh, now, uh, if we approve this list, what, what happens after that? Each one of these is a little bit different. And this was a, a an existing organization, I think, that we that we partnered with. So how, how does how does the decision go on from here? The East Tampa Community Redevelopment Partnership existed prior to the CRA board establishing a CAC or Community Advisory Committee uh, policy that each CRA would have a CAC. In order to not have competing groups within East Tampa and within EBOR, the CAC policy recognizes the governing boards of the two existing groups to act as the CAC. And so the governing board of the partnership then became the CAC. We elect our CAC members uh, according to the bylaws of the East Tampa Community Redevelopment Partnership, which were also amended to be in alignment with the CRA board CAC policy. So we simply, uh, when we advertise every year for half of our CAC to turn over, every two years are our term limit, uh, we bring all of the people that qualify per the partnership bylaws. Uh, they get vetted by an ad hoc committee of community members. And we then bring that slate of candidates to the CRA board to confirm that slate of candidates. We then go every year at our September partnership meeting and we hold an actual paper ballot vote uh, right now, we have reserved Reagan, and it is our intention to have That's long periods of time where people will be able to come in and cast a paper ballot without having everyone in the room all at once. And we'll be having hours both in the daytime and in the evening for anybody who works. 
and, and who gets <clears throat> sorry who gets to vote who's qualified to vote Members of the East Tampa Community Revitalization Partnership and the only requirement to be a participant and to vote is to have participated and attended at least one partnership meeting during the past 12 months. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else? Anyone else? Let me say this before we do take the uh, roll call vote. The person who sat on the actual CEC of East Tampa you know, numbers have always been down. But for me to see this number increase tells me that people believe in the in the partnership now. They want to be a part of something that's moving. A lot of programs are going on in East Tampa with our affordable housing, tree trimming, and other programs with our young people. People see things are turning, so they want to be involved. The biggest thing I used to hear about the, the CAC East Tampa partnership is they don't do nothing, or we're just arguing all the time, and I don't have time to waste my time. I think things are getting done, and that's a beautiful thing that people see things are being done and want to be a part of the fostering a better CEC board, fostering a better East Tampa. So I'm excited about this. Any further discussion? I, I, I agree with your sentiments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? Madam Chair, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, roll call vote, please. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dingfelder? Yes. Anis Kako? Carlson? Yes. Petro? Wholeheartedly, yes. Miranda? Yes. Motion carried with Manis Kako being absent at vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, we'll move the information report to a new business. Uh, Mr. Vieira? Um, none today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Dingfelder? Coffee today. Great meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Maniscalco has already left. We'll go to uh, Mr. Citro. Mr. Chair, nothing except I would like to congratulate four of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Carlson, Mr. Vieira, Mr. Maniscalco, and you yourself, Mr. Goods, for getting on the qualification of the best politician in the Bay Area uh, poll by uh, Creative Loafing. Congratulations to you four. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. I didn't Carlson. even know that. <laughs> I, it's Carlson. Yeah, th <clears throat> I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for moving this agenda item forward um, and for um, bearing with all the long discussions. I think in the long run, uh, discussions are better for everybody in the community. And also, in particular, thanks to the staff for all the uh, hours and hours and hours of time that they put together on it. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for your leadership. Thank you, sir. Mr. Miranda. Nothing, sir. Thank you very much. Well, we've come to another uh, fine conclusion of a meeting that had good discussion, uh, good advice that came back from legal and Ms. Van Long. Uh, I think the community sees and, and, and appreciates what we're trying to do, what we're trying to work, but we just got to make sure we got all the ducks in the road to make sure that we're on point with whatever we do. And I appreciate this council for working together and having some harmony to be able to get things moved for good discussion and positive discussion. So I thank you all for all your leadership, what you do. Can I have a motion to receive and file? Motion to receive and file. Second, Vera. Second by Mr. Uh, Miranda, second by Mr. Vera. Roll call, please. Vera? Yes. Goods? Yes. Think Felder? Yes. Maniscalco? Carlson? Yes. Citro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carried with Maniscalco being absent at vote. And thank you, Madam Clerk, for your work as you do. Thank you.